Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA, home of Central Washington University and home of the Ice Age Floods A to Z live stream series. What happened to the snow? It's gone. It's been raining like crazy, like most places in the Pacific Northwest in the last few days. So that's a shot live out the window here. And here's a shot in the cozy confines of an office on the first floor of Discovery Hall, the Geology and Physics Building, here at Central Washington University. Hi, everybody. Happy February, and welcome to this series. Welcome to this episode. Thank you for being with us today. The local time. It is 11.47, I think, something like that, and we're going to begin this episode on Glacial Lake Missoula at the top of the hour. That's about 13 minutes from now. Today's date is February 1st, 2024. So, you know the drill by now. If you're watching live, we'll get a chance to talk to each other, say hi, that sort of thing. If you are watching this in replay, then you can scrub ahead, skip ahead, fast forward, click on the next chapter title, however you want to do it. But this program will begin in about 13 minutes from now. Looks like we're five by five. Where are you viewing from today? Can I say hi to a few of you? And just settle into this experience. Uh, we have 330 at the moment, and folks will continue to uh, flow towards us here. Kirk. Kirk from Falmouth, Oregon creator of all of these mugs. Here's to you, Kirk. During Kansas, the Tyatan Andesite in Natchez, that's Pat, Jarrett, Virginia, Twin Falls, Idaho, Lake, Lake Chelan, Washington, Scranton, Pennsylvania, Portugal, Olympia, Washington, Houston, Texas, Northeast Portland, scrolling real fast, but I'm just grabbing what I can, Davis, California, Okanagan Falls, B.C., Tasmania, Nashville, Tennessee, Liberty Lake, that's Glenn, hello, Glenn in Spokane, Fairwood, uh, Washington, Morton, Illinois, Grayson, uh, Kentucky, uh, Swansea, Wales, just tucking in, I think that's what you said, you, you in for the night? That's what my mom used to say, I'm in for the night. Index Pluton, Exmouth, UK, Helena, Montana, Chelmsford, England, got plenty of Brits here, Bergen, Norway, Phoenix, Arizona, Forest Grove, Oregon, El Paso, Texas, Indian Trail, North Carolina, Newport, Oregon, Grantville, Georgia. You know what this is? This is a jolt of adrenaline. I was a little bit sleepy this morning. I even was walking around the building kind of muttering to myself in the last 10 minutes, and I'm like, I don't even feel like doing this. <laughs> And then you guys are here, and I just perk right up. So your presence here live is a gift to me uh, and to all of us, I suppose. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for that. San Lorenzo Valley, California. California, says Papagino. Yeah, Bishop, California. Anaconda, Montana. Sweden, Kirk. Ripon, Wisconsin. Home of Dick Bennett, I believe. Famous basketball coach. Lincoln, England. I got my badger red on today. There's another reason I'm wearing red. You could probably figure it out. Penticton, British Columbia. Springfield, Oregon. Wales, UK. Rotterdam. Oscars from Pineapple Express, California. My God, we got more. I got a lot of, lot of UK folks here today. Wonderful. I hope everything's going well over there on the other side of the pond uh, on a Thursday evening. West Frankfort, Southern Illinois, St. Louis Hills, Missouri, Redmond, Washington, Nanaimo, British Columbia, and so on. Let me check my stations quick, and then I think I've, I've got one gift I want to say thank you for, and then I've got a question for you. So we're checking uh, the desktop there. That looks fine. And uh, here's Desky, and we know the drill here by now. And here we are, February 1st, with Larry Smith, and 
Not that many shows left, I must say. V, W, X, Y, and Z. And after today, we will be with Sean Wilsey on Sunday morning from Southern Idaho. And then a week from today, John Schellenberger from Toppenish, Washington. Uh, and Scott Burns from Portland, Oregon will be with us uh, in a week and a half or so. And there's the Zoom window. Doesn't look much different than that. And again, shelf is working fine. And again, the uh, window cam is, is doing just fine here, it appears. I'm happy to see the snow gone, personally. I like to bicycle, and I can finally get my bike out of the shed and, and get it rolling again. We just live a few blocks from campus. It's, ha it's easy to go back and forth that way. Okay, one quick thank you. Thank you to Clay in Montana. And Clay sent this. And Clay writes, nice things, nice things. This is Belt Supergroup Rock. Uh, the sample comes from an outcrop located off exit 75 on Interstate 90, just west of Alberton, Montana. Here, there's a large tilted bed of Belt Supergroup that breaks apart into large pieces, like the one enclosed. As opposed to borrowing the massive piece, lo lo as opposed to borrowing the massive piece located in your building, now you have a much more manageable piece that's all your own. Beautiful Precambrian ripple marks from Western Montana. Thank you, Clay. You must have visited the building, I guess, to know that we have a huge slab of this, but you're right. I've got my own personal sample now for a Montana show today. Thank you. Much appreciated. Looking for some more 5 by 5s just for uh, mental, uh, mental assurance that I don't have to think about that. And here's my question live before, we, uh, before I start to get serious about today's show. I'm, I'm looking forward to today. Thank you, Peter. Peter, you're always pretty quick on those 5 by 5s Thanks. I'm just curious now. I don't think I'm going to change what I'm doing, but I'm just curious because I've seen a few things in the live chat on the replays the last few shows. By the way, when you watch the replay, you can watch the live chat scroll by. Are you aware of that? A few of you I don't think are, but you, you can click on show live chat, and then as you're watching a replay of this thing, you can see the chat go by if you feel like you want to. So what have I seen in the live chat? I, I, you know, Backcountry Gary, I think, in the last show said, yeah, I was listening to most of it, and then I just tuned in to watch it in the last 45 minutes or something, this guy Cooley show last time. And what are some other people saying? Like, I can't believe I just figured out that I can watch this on one screen, and then I can do the live chat on my phone. So my question is, uh, these are three-hour shows now, right? My question is, do you really sit and stare into a computer screen for three straight hours and do nothing else? Or do you have this playing on a computer with the audio, but you're like baking bread or cleaning the garage or whatever? Or do you watch this and then you know, total attention for 20 minutes and then you go uh, rake the leaves? Or maybe you have some audio piping into your earbuds or something? Uh, I'm just going to continue to freelance now. I think I've continued to hear things like, I think Jeff from Vinman says, yeah, I was listening to the show, driving to Yakima and back. Like, are people listening to these episodes, these live streams, but not watching? Um, do you have two monitors or three monitors? Is one monitor on this with the live chat and another monitor you're like cruising around on Google Earth or you're looking at the papers or something? I'm sure there's many different combinations of experiences and I'm going to really enjoy reading. I don't think I've ever really asked this specifically. I can see tons of stuff here now. So um, I probably won't be able to grasp any of this in real time, but I'm, I'm, just, I'm just curious. Um, what do I do when I watch a YouTube video? Well, I usually have my headphones on and I'm sitting in my recliner in front of the fireplace and Bijou's in my lap and I'm just, you know, totally absorbed in the video. But those are like 20 minutes or whatever, or maybe, you know, norally or something, you know, 30 minutes. Uh, that's my total 
I'm locked in. Because I know it's only a half an hour or less. But three-hour live streams, I can't believe you're just sitting there the whole time. If you are, that's great. But uh, I'm, And again, I don't think I'm going to change what I'm doing. I'm, I'm very happy with what we've been doing. And I like taking my time, especially when we're done with the guest. And I just slow myself down and read all these letters. And there's going to be plenty of that today. I'm, I'm just, oh, let me just grab a couple things. Oh, here's Jeff from Vinman's. Listening is fine until the doc cam comes on. Okay, I don't even understand that, Jeff. Why, why, okay. So if you truly are listening to the, if you're a trucker and you're le- listening to these while you're on the road, that must be expensive, right? To stream something using data as you're driving for three hours? I have no idea. I've never really done it. I've never listened to a live program, like a radio program, basically. But I guess just the part where, whether it's replay or live, uh, thinking about how much of what we're doing here works in audio form only. Never really thought about that. I think I, I get what Jeff's saying now. Like if I'm actually showing something on the document camera, you can't see it. Okay, that's what you mean. Yeah. Um, okay. So that, yeah, because you can't see the document. That's right. But you can't see the slides either. Like a p- plenty of this is visual, isn't it? Okay. Never really thought to ask that before. Okay. A um, couple final, I guess I got three minutes before we start. Can I say hi to just a couple more of you? And then I will figure out how to get connected to our guest, Larry Smith, who is hopefully standing by in Butte, Montana, waiting for an email from me with a Zoom invite. Where are you viewing from? A couple more hellos to you in the next minute. Thank you. Delay in the comments. There's Sky Cooley. And Pat from Yakima. And Wendy. I see Dennis and Wes and Carla and Cindy. Romper room now. Scott. Omac, Washington. Dayton, Ohio. Rochester, New York, Kingsgate, Washington, Don's in the Firehouse in Los Angeles, Marysville, Washington, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Moneda, Virginia, Puyallup, Washington, Helena, Montana, Smyrna, Washington. Hey, Brett, you may be in some sort of tractor somewhere doing something up on the uh, Smyrna bench. Memphis, Tennessee, Lyle, Washington, Walla Walla, Glasgow, Scotland, Kamloops, B.C., Romper Room, Romper Room. Everybody's liking Romper Room. I'm definitely dating myself then. Yeah, remember when Ed Sullivan... Joel Gombon's like, why am I always with all these old fossils, man? Where's the young people working on these floods? <laughs> okay, good. i got to start concentrating. Thank you for being with us. A cheers a toast to you, and we'll start the program in two minutes. We'll give you a shout out the window as I connect with... Uh, with Zoom. Thank you. We'll start in two minutes. Hope you enjoyed today's program. Okay, there's Zoom, everybody. I'm starting a new meeting. I'm getting this over to the appropriate window. I'm making it a little bit smaller. It's like, why is that man in the red shirt talking to me? Well, He's older, and he needs to speak to himself so that he doesn't get confused. Email, default email, Uptown Larry. That's Gmail to Gmail. And away that goes. So, Larry, if you're watching the broadcast, I just sent the email. I'm going to go take my walk. And hopefully, Larry, you will be on my Zoom window when I return from my short little walk. Everybody else? Hot mic. See you in two minutes. Hot mic.
Good afternoon, Larry. How are you today? Okay, well, let me... I did a little, we haven't started the program yet. I did a little, so I do these early things before the top of the hour and I just visit with the live viewers and that sort of thing. So right now, um, I'm glad that we're functional and they cannot hear you yet. And so, and there's a bit of a delay as well. So I think you're just, you're looking at video out my window, I think, right? Right now, the video, if you can see some video, it's looking out my office window. Yeah. So... Are you hearing double versions of me or just one? Double? Okay, can you mute your YouTube window? That work. That works. Or oh, and and so is it now just a single voice for me? Okay, good. So yeah, you'll just be kind of thinking about the you'll just be hearing me basically and not seeing video, which is totally fine. And it's just a Zoom call now, basically, just you and I on the Zoom. Are you comfortable with that, or did you really want to see what I'm doing? Yeah, so that that works just fine. Yeah, without, um, yeah, that second window, I think, was just to uh, distract you more than anything else. So I think we're, I think we're good. Uh, your audio, yeah, well, um, you can ignore that, too, if you want. So we will do a little bit of, yeah, yeah. Um, Great. Well, um, I'm going to start the program in just a second. And when I do that, I'm just going to slide you off to the side so that they cannot see you. And then in about 10 minutes, I'll be just bringing you in and we'll just be talking on Zoom, essentially. So ev ev everything OK on your end? The broadcast? Um, I don't think you need to mute yourself on Zoom because once I, on YouTube, yeah, on the YouTube window, if you go down to the lower, can you hover on the lower left corner of your YouTube window, like where you have a pause button and a fast forward button, there's also a little uh, audio icon and that's where you can mute it or, or bring the audio up or down. Okay, yeah. Okay, well, and there might be a little bit of a delay with the, with the video, so you might hear what I'm doing, and then you won't see it for a few seconds after that. But other than that, I think we're good. Okay, all right, okay. Well, I appreciate your time today, Larry. I, I'm really excited to visit with you, so I, I promise 10 minutes or less we'll come to you, okay? Okay, great. Thank you much. All right, sliding you over. A pleasant good afternoon to you all, and welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. This is the Ice Age Floods A to Z live stream series, and we're coming down to the end now. We only have six shows left, and this episode I'm particularly excited about. Glacial Lake Missoula with Larry Smith. Larry is in Butte, Montana, and he will be on momentarily. And I'm wearing a red shirt to remind you that we are stage two today. We are Glacial Lake Missoula, and we have evidence only for stage two with Glacial Lake Missoula. Filling and draining, filling and draining, God knows how many times. We're going to talk to the expert in just a moment, but put me on the clock. I want to do a few things to set things up. In fact, I'll take my headphones off. Take my headphones off for this. Uh, Ten minutes or less, let's go. So we've had two... We've really had one main question since Christmas, haven't we? What the hell happened to the Spokane ice sheet? That's been our question, and it continues to be our question. But a related question today is why was Jay Harlan Bretz so afraid of Glacial Lake Missoula? And that sounds a little dramatic, but what I mean is by the end of the 1920s, our, our, our buddy Bretz is doing field work, in the floor of Glacial Lake Missoula. He's taking a bunch of notes. Our expert Larry Smith has not seen those notes until this past week and a half. 
But Brett's never published on those notes. Why didn't he? And during the ambush meeting of 1927, when the biggest objection to his outrageous hypothesis was, where's the water coming from? He refused to say Glacial Lake Missoula. Now, he knew about Glacial Lake Missoula for sure, for all sorts of reasons we've already talked about in this series. Pardee, 1910, published on Glacial Lake Missoula. Chamberlain and Salisbury, his two mentors at the University of Chicago, they came up with the idea before Pardee did. And we're going to see some papers today posted on the website that are also pre-field work of J. Harlan Bretz. They're working on Glacial Lake Missoula, Campbell in 1915, and William Morris Davis in 1920. So why is this guy, Bretz, avoiding Glacial Lake Missoula like the plague? I have a few running thoughts. I don't know if Larry will want to go there with us. We're mostly going to Larry for two things. We want to learn as much as we can about the data that he's acquired over his whole career on Glacial Lake Missoula and the sediments on the floor of Glacial Lake Missoula. But we also want to learn a little bit about the techniques, the techniques, the tool belt that Larry Smith has been using. And we might wonder if Larry's tools can be used for older deposits. And we'll explore that with him. I've got two Sharpie cartoons going to document camera to make this happen. So yeah, next show will be read as well. Bonneville Flood with Sean Wilsey. But if you remember, previously on Falcon Crest, we were with Sky Cooley, and we realized that there was all sorts of old clues of older Ice Age flood stories, younger than 2.6 million years ago, but older than our three colors that we've been playing with in this series. Red is marine isotope stage 2, 20,000 years ago, roughly. But we're going to see a bunch of dates from Larry today that are in the neighborhood of 20,000. But, of course, that's just a running number that we're using. We're just, we're just playing with it. Orange is stage 4. Blue is stage 6, down to 150,000 years ago. So Sky's episode last time was looking at these older stories and what we know and what we don't know. Here it is, a little bit more gussied up for you. Red, orange, blue, the colors that we're bringing through each of these shows. And the check mark means that Joel tells us that on the Ostoria fan, we have major glaciations from stage two and stage six. Purple's an older ice event yet. Don't know much about it. Unf un unsure which stage we're talking about. I was pushing Sky to do brown last time before I realized he had a bunch of slides that just had blue and red. <laughs> So apologies after the fact to Sky. I finally figured it out. But older than 780,000 years ago is a reversed paleomag signature. And so, yeah, we've got all sorts of history going on here. But what am I promising to do with the document camera before we go to Larry? Trying to frame what we've done with Brett so far and why I think, it's my working thought, I'm just playing with it, why I think Bretz was not that interested in Glacial Lake Missoula until late in the 1920s. Let's do it. So I remind you that the Spokane ice sheet looks like this. Sorry. Looks like this on J. Harlan Bretz's maps starting in 1923. City of Spokane, blue ice, in our working story in this series, 150,000 years ago, and the channeled scab lands of eastern Washington go right up to the margin of the Spokane ice sheet. And therefore, Bretz's working hypothesis throughout the 1920s is that whatever is going on, wherever the water is coming from to create these incredible uh, coolies, scabs, sweeping loose away, and everything else, Brett's in the 1920s is saying, I think the water's coming directly from the Spokane ice sheet. So using a series of episodes we've had so far this winter, does this one work for you? Slow down. This is Spokane ice sheet. This is stage six. This is blue. This is 150,000 years ago. And in one diagram, to me, this is what Bretz is continuing to work on all through the 1920s. Subglacial flow, fire hoses of water. But maybe this is a new way to be a little bit more specific for you in case you've just heard the words before, but you couldn't quite follow what I was saying. 
Brett's in the 1920s says, I've got all these channels being carved. We're excavating basalt in eastern Washington, the Grand Coulee, Moses Coulee, and so on, the Cheney Palouse track. Here's the city of Spokane, but Brett says, I've got an ice margin right at the head of each of these channels. And so Bretz is saying, we have major trenches. Do you remember Jerome Lessman's show? He called them gutters, because I casually called them gutters in an episode we did a year ago. So we have these tremendous trenches coming down across the border from British Columbia. And they have names. You've heard of the Purcell Trench, or the Rocky Mountain Trench, maybe the Okanagan Trench. But the idea is, and the idea that Brett's had is that for all through the 1920s, Brett's is saying, I think the water of the Spokane flood filling all these channels simultaneously is coming underneath this ice sheet, subglacial. Get it? And just this simple cartoon to me says, that's why Brett's wasn't that interested in Glacial Lake Missoula. He had his hypothesis for where the water was coming from. It was coming from underneath the Spokane ice sheet itself. So why are we going to talk to Larry? Why am I wearing a red shirt? Well, in the late 1920s, Brett starts visiting western Montana. Many of these deposits that Larry has studied in his whole career Bretz was interested in Glacial Lake Missoula, finally. Now, why did he suddenly get interested in Glacial Lake Missoula? If he knew about it all through the 1920s, why did he start visiting in the summers of 28 and 29? Well, you could say one narrative is the ambush meeting really shook him up, and he, it really bothered him that he didn't have a source of water, and so he started looking in Montana for his source of water. I'm pausing for dramatic effect. I've tried to stay true to the Brett's timeline, but just for a second, before we go to Larry, I want to peek to the end of the book. You've maybe wanted to do that, but now we're going to do it. We're going to peek to Brett's last paper in 1969. He's 87 years old. And this whole winter, we've been wondering when and if does Brett's ever totally get off of this Spokane flood and say it was a mistake, and I now see that Glacial Lake Missoula is the entire source of the Missoula floods and the entire source of all the water that I needed for all those years back in the 20s. I posted that paper for you. It's on nickzetner.com under Brett's. Brett's 1969. What's the title of Brett's last paper in 1969? The Lake Missoula Floods and the Channeled Scabland. Well, here he is in black and white. It sure looks like he's raising the red flag, sorry, raising the white flag on this Spokane flood idea. It sure looks like he's getting off of the blue thing entirely. But if we go to one of the last pages of Brett's last paper, let's read this paragraph. Glaciation at the channel heads. The writer believed, past tense, that till deposits in subdued moraine-like forms in the part of the Columbia Plateau between Spokane and the Columbia Rivers on the north and the heads of the Cheney Palouse and Telford Crab Creek channels on the south recorded glaciation almost up to the channel heads. Okay, so far so good. He's saying, I used to believe that. I believed, past tense. Back in the 20s, I believed that those, those, that till was there, the ice margin was south of Spokane. Richard Foster Flint also saw this area as glaciated. Jerry Richmond, who we're going to save till session Z, viewers, Jerry Richmond has dismissed this view and sees the tract as flood swept. But, the, <laughs> but here he goes. Brett says, but the total lack of isolated residual hills of Luz, so prominent a feature of flood erosion elsewhere on the plateau, seems to argue for glacial rather than flood removal. Perhaps both events occurred, glaciation 
before flooding. So this is the map from Jerry Richmond that we will study in our last episode, and this is our first look, if you're brand new to the topic, of Glacial Lake Missoula. This is the topic today. It was definitely a thing. We've got all sorts of wonderful data coming from Larry in less than 30 seconds. Here's the famous ice dam in northern Idaho. And here's Jerry Richmond's map in 1965 with the ice margin. And here are the channel heads from Brett. Even in Brett's last paper, he says, I still think I want ice earlier and then the Glacial Lake Missoula floods later. So we got to work on this timing. And who better to talk to about timing of Glacial Lake Missoula and the Missoula floods than our guest, Larry Smith. Let me get my headphones going. We'll bring them in and we'll just go where we want to go. Thank you. Larry Smith, how are you today in Butte? I'm great. I, yep. appreci I appreciate you coming on. I, I don't know how, what kind of a delay we have here, but we don't have to worry about that now. It can just be you and I chatting, and you've got all sorts of wonderful things to share uh, on screen. I'm so glad that this is working for you. Um, are you still teaching, or have you retired now? No, I retired a couple years ago during COVID, actually. Oh, did you really? Okay. Did yeah. You, was that the plan all along or COVID kind of yeah, accelerated that? It ended up being the plan. I turned 65 and thought, hmm, I can retire. <laughs> yeah, totally. And and how many years were you teaching in Butte at Montana Tech? And was Glacial Lake Missoula research there the whole time through your time in Butte? Yeah, I, I started working it for the, and I'll show that in some slides, the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology. Okay. And then I switched over to teaching and taught for about 12 years after working at the Bureau for 16. Um, I see. Position came open and I was able to fill it. And nice. uh, I enjoyed the heck out of it. It was great. Well, and well. I've been working on Glacial Lake Missoula since about 2000-ish. And that spilled over from my groundwater work with the Bureau, looking for the aquifers. I see. And the flood deposits are great aquifers. <laughs> Were you building on previous work directly? Like, did somebody hand some baton to you as far as the history of this Glacial Lake Missoula uh, sediment record? Not at all. Okay. Um, other people have worked on it. You know, I, I don't claim to, you know, find a lot of stuff. I mean, yeah. I, I depended on Pardee's work. Um, but honestly, I backed into it from doing aquifer and confining unit mapping. And I mapped the Kalispell Valley, the Flathead Valley north of the lake, and published some stuff on that on the early 2000s. But I had done the work a few years before. And then I got working around the Missoula and downstream from Missoula area, a nine mile St. Regis, that country. Mm. Um, for groundwater. And I was like, what are these gravels that are sitting under lake deposits? They're the aquifer here. And then I've been working on them ever since. This is not my life. I'm old enough that this has not been my life's work by any means. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's do a little bit more of this. I, I'm loving this. And then we can go to some of the slides because I'm, I'm looking forward, especially, of course, to your Google Earth movie that you want to narrate for us, which uh, is terrific. Uh, your audio is working great, by the way. I'm glad we tested oh, that the other day. It sounds perfect. Um, Without knowing much, and I don't have to pretend, I don't know much, I would assume that the floor of Glacial Lake Missoula is just a bunch of fine silts. And, and yet I keep hearing, and I guess I've seen a couple of places where these incredible gravels that you're talking about exist. Why would there be high energy gravels on the floor of a quiet glacial lake? Because the silts got wiped out by some of the last floods. And it's amazing that, you know, just the preservation of those silts all the way down near the, uh, the ice dam um, shows that the last floods were not energetic enough to completely gut the valley out. Hmm. Um, we've got silts that a, uh, a master student I worked with and dated him 
near Heron, Montana, which is, you know, spitting distance from that last ice dam yeah. that are 16,000 years old and they're still right there. But the inner canyon was where the last floods, you know, ripped the guts out and exposed uh, the gravels underneath. So some of the gravel, I think, is just backfill waning flood from the really big floods and filled mm. up uh, some of those bedrock uh, canyons upstream from uh, Ponderay. You're I'm so talking. easy. You're so easy to talk to. Thank. This is going to be a blast. Hmm. Uh, one more before we go to a few images. I'm wearing a red shirt in the honor of Glacial Lake, <laughs> Missoula. What's your biggest number? What's your oldest age that you have from anything on the floor of Glacial Lake, Missoula here in 2024? Okay, the oldest age I would even mention is about 21,000 years. Okay, I've got older ages. I I've. I don't know how many ages I've made, you know, 60, 70 ages, but you really have to work with them to, to make sure that you'd, you'd publish them. Um, yeah. I've got some old ages of 28,000 that are maybe on older gravels, maybe just stream deposits, you know, just pre Lake Missoula. Um, and I don't necessarily trust them to that okay. they're part of the story. So if you don't trust I sampled no... a bunch of gravel, a bunch of sediment underneath the silts, trying to understand how old those deposits were. Okay, I lied. But, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask a couple more questions. I can't hold it. So there's. Sure. I I don't have a blue shirt in the closet, basically. But there, there's nothing even there's there's nothing even remotely stage six or stage four that's anywhere in that basin. Never found them. That doesn't mean they're not there. Okay. Sky of Sky and I have talked about it, you know, and <clears throat> what really is happening in the mission in the Mission Valley is a is a good question. Um huh. but there's only a couple ages from the Mission Valley and they're all they're all red. They're all looking okay. red. Okay, they're looking um, pretty red. Okay. Yeah. That doesn't mean they're not there, but you know, I've talked right. with Jim O'Connor and you know they it just makes sense that there were an old lake there, but haven't found it. Huh. Well, I was just thinking this morning as I was walking in. So you've got nothing but red upstream of the channeled scablands, and O'Connor's got nothing but red downstream, downstream of Willula Gap and the Columbia Gorge. And yet mm -hmm. in this in this middle stem, Brett's and everybody back in the 20s is talking about this older time. So we're continuing to be fascinated by that. But I mean, we got to listen that <laughs> upstream and downstream, there's not even a faint hint of this blue stuff as we see it right now. It's really fascinating. Um, okay, I keep lying. I'm going to say one more. Before we get to the slides, can you, I know you have at least one slide talking about this, but for our beginners, how are you getting these dates? Can you can you give us a nice thumbnail version of it before we get a little bit more fancy? Because I do want to talk about this dating technique and how we might use it in the channeled scab lands as well. How are you getting those numbers? Optical dating, which okay. is luminescence dating. Um, some optically stimulated luminescence dating, but it's basically on quartz or feldspar. The last time it was exposed to the sunlight lost its radiation damage and then it builds up that radiation damage when it's uh when it's buried and you can you stimulate it it shines how much shine is proportional to age and how much radiation damage it's seen thank you that's not the first time you've given that explanation and that's that's <laughs> that's, that's, that's old hat and that's beautiful i wish said. i had Carbon-14. I wish we had tephras. I wish we had all that stuff and haven't found much of it, but did find a carbon-14 date, a couple of them, recently, and going to talk about that at the Spokane GSA. Okay, good. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a beautiful cliffhanger. Let's try a few slides, and then we'll see how much of a roll we get on. And I, you know that I might interrupt once or twice just to go back to this because I enjoy this so much. But um, feel free to find that share button and take your time, yep. and let's, let's see if we got it rolling. Viewers, are we doing okay? I'm talking to the viewers now. 
Are we five by five with both Larry and myself? Are we feeling comfortable? Uh, people are wondering what red means and everything. So we've got some, some new um, folks to the scene. Thank you, Peter. Uh, okay, we've got a successfully shared screen and it's nice landscape mode. And maybe does that we, work for people? It does. Do we? Do you want to go absolutely full, like hit the presenter I, screen? I actually would, and I think I'm going to leave. I'll lose your head, but um, that's okay. Ooh, that's maybe down below. Oh no, I didn't lose your head. Okay. Uh, yeah, good. Okay. So please, let's so go for it. Here's okay. You see down in the lower right, Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology. This is an old map I made because I was still working for the Bureau then. Mm -hmm. And the boundaries of my existence were the state of Montana. Because <laughs> okay. I worked for the state. So yeah. I didn't go out of the state to do any of this work. But uh here's the you know, the ice sheet kind of under here. Mm -hmm. It's not perfect, but it's not bad. Um Here's Flathead Lake and the Polson Moraine. We'll talk a little more about that, but Sky introduced that nicely before. Thank you. Mission Valley. And so uh, I have a series of basins here. This I call this the, the Flathead Basin, you know, where water in the Lake Missoula is in the Flathead. This is the Northwest area. Mm -hmm. This is the lower Clark Fork downstream of Nine Mile. We'll talk okay. about Nine Mile. Mm -hmm. And this is upstream of Nine Mile. Then you got the Bitterroot and then the upper Clark Fork Blackfoot. So these are the different basins, sub-basins. Most of my work has been here. I've been mm -hmm. all over, but, um, and I'll, I'll explain why. Okay. So this is, eh, you know, this isn't necessarily the max at 1265 meters. I know Jim O'Connor, you know, we, we think it might've gone up to 1295, but- okay. That changes the volumes a little bit. Mm -hmm. But the the next slide, what I did was I selected these different lake levels. And just to give you an idea, where is the water in the basin? Mm. You know, let's say at the 1265, which is about maximum, mm -hmm. most of the water is in the Mission Valley and the Northwest area. Not a lot in the lower Clark Fork downstream from Nine Mile. The Missoula Valley, not a lot. The Bitterroot, not a lot. And very little in the Blackfoot. Hmm. Um, and of course, as you look at these, because we probably had lake levels all the way, you know, at different times it filled up to different levels. But the vast majority of the water comes out of the Mission Valley or the Flathead Valley and Northwest area. Okay. I've worked in this country. And I think one of the pluses is since not as much water was running through during these big um, catastrophic discharges, there's actually a pretty good preservation of material here. Whereas huh. a lot of the, you know, and I'll show you some of this, but where Pardee worked was mostly in this, and they were seeing just little pieces of these bars, whereas mm -hmm. you've got full bar preservation mm -hmm. in the lower Clark Fork. Mm -hmm. It's just a side comment. Yep, very good. And these are the different lake volumes, you know, calculated just from the modern um, land surface and using good old ArcGIS. Okay. So again, just some geometry. I'm here in Butte, and I see there's somebody from Anaconda here too. <laughs> um, uh, the ice dams up here, basically, the ice dam was in various places at various time, but I just put it at the border. Sure. Bolsa Marine. I'll talk about a spot at Tarkio. Here's Nine Mile. There's the town of Missoula. And I've done a lot of work because I'm really slow at Garden Gulch. I worked there for about 10 years before <laughs> okay. publishing a couple articles. Huh. So, okay, back up. You know, why is there a lake there? Pardee, all these other people recognize it. The two big things are shorelines mm -hmm. here on Mount Jumbo outside of Missoula. 
here in Camas Prairie, some beautiful shorelines. Uh, I'm really looking forward to um, having LIDAR all over the place. Then oh, we can map these things. Oh. We don't have LIDAR in a lot of the valleys, so mm -hmm. we haven't been able to map them in any detail. I see. And they're really hard to see in some places. Yes. And then there's glacial lake sediments. To show this picture again, but this is the classic nine mile section that anybody that drives I-90, you gotta slow down on this hill and just gawk at the, <laughs> this wonderful road cut um, that shows the cyclistic uh, nature of silts and sands at the lake bottom. But you get up near Polson um, in the Mission Valley and oh my gosh, the thickness of what has been mapped as glacial lake sediments is up to 150 meters. I mean, hundreds of feet of sediment, whereas it's only, you know, uh, 40 feet thick here. Uh huh. It's different around. Okay. Okay. Now, this is a Google Earth movie that I downsampled, so hopefully the frame rate is not gonna screw us up like it did when we tried it earlier. Fingers crossed. And we're gonna take a look at some of, you know, at these locations just to get a, an idea of the geometry and the um, positions of these landforms. Mm -hmm. And it takes about seven minutes to go through unless we, um, stop so is it really herky jerky it's still kind of jerky but it'll work for us it'll work for okay. us larry we're just kind of lurching here and there but it's better than it was the other day so let's keep it Good. going yeah so here's the missoula area okay the sentinel mount jumbo and then you go downstream we're going to be going downstream a, a while getting yeah. into the nine mile and here's the Clark Fork River, and here's the freeway where you can see the nine mile section that should be a National Historic Landmark District. Yeah. In mind. yeah. Um, but I'm going to try to pause this and not break it. So here's Nine Mile, and this is the Clark Fork River. Up on top of this hill, which is known as Cayuse Hill, mm -hmm. is a gravel pit. This is 550 feet above. The river level. Good and this Lord. is the Reben gravel pit, and we'll we'll see that again uh, with some photos. But this is a flood deposit on top of this hill. Okay, thank um, you. I first visited that only seven eight years ago. So uh, uh. Uh, he opened up the pit a few years before that, and he called me and he said, "Hey, you should come see this," <laughs> which was way cool. Yeah, totally. And then we're going to turn around and we're going to head down the Alberton Gorge. Yeah. Um, so things narrow down, and this is, you know, River Rafters Paradise going through the town of Alberton. And so the lake, you know, was up here. I'll turn the lake on and off a few times so you get a feeling how deep the lake was here. Okay. Um, and then the gorge opens up in this little draw here near Sear, mm -hmm. C-Y-R. Mm -hmm. And so it, the water was going out here and here's a big eddy bar. Nicely preserved, bit, there's a gravel pit right there. Wow. Uh, it used to be mapped as bedrock, still is. There's where the high level, lake level was. Still mapped, so, as, still mapped as bedrock? Still mapped as bedrock. We got to fix the map. Here's another bar in the middle, but it's not a massive bar. But huh. my favorite bar in the world is the Tarkio bar. Yeah. This thing, I worked a lot in this area. You can actually see, and on the there's a little strip of LIDAR here, and you can see beautiful dunes going up the back side of it, too. You sure can. Um, it's about 550 feet above river level, but it's very likely this canyon was cut during some of those big floods. Hmm. And I'll show an outcrop shot here in a mm -hmm. little bit. But really importantly, you got, so you got flood gravel here, but this is all that silt deposits, just like the nine mile. 
And so they're sitting on top of flood gravel in this valley. And you can see that. And I looked at all the water well logs, you know, since I was doing subsurface mapping. Um, that shows that there was a big honking flood or more early. And then the lake refilled. And whenever it drained, it preserved all these silt deposits. I see. So that shows you right off the bat the old flood was or floods yeah were early the mm -hmm. late floods were were uh, old floods were big the late floods were small sounds familiar and uh party said this in 1942 huh. um i can't remember the paragraph yeah but i quoted him <laughs> um you know basic cross-cutting relationships yeah good old gf yeah this is the Aberton Gorge, and I think that's mostly bedrock at the bottom. We're okay. just going to continue downstream. There are some valley glaciers up in there. This is as much as the lake really got to be. The mm. flows went straight down here, and there's a big gravel bar at the bottom end of this, but, you know, it also went around. So I think that gully was probably cut during the floods. Is this still I-90? This is I-90. Wow. We're going to get off I-90 here in a minute. Okay. The Y-90 goes across the Clark Fork River. Oh, and this yeah. this is the town of St. Regis. Oh, that's right, yeah. And there's this beautiful little channel cutting in bedrock. Why is that there? You know, that had to get cut during a big flood. Huh. There's still lake deposits, you know, survived up these valleys, but most of this is just river gravel. There's lake deposits, pieces around huh. and then the flows were going wham there's how deep the lake was mm. um the flows were going wham against this outcrop and were ripping ripping boulders off of it and there's a bunch of imbricated boulders pretty much at river level. I did not discover this site. Mm -hmm. uh, Glenn Kopke from the um, Forest Service brought me here the first time. I don't claim to have discovered, you know, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But good old Glenn, he really helped out. Good old Glenn. And I brought uh, Vic Baker there. I've brought various field trips there thinking, gosh, can we get an exposure date on these boulders? Mm. Uh, nope. They're crappy uh, belt rock. <laughs> okay. That's the way it goes. We don't have enough granite. You know, we yeah. need granite. Right, right, right. <laughs> okay, but the last big bar I'm going to mention is this one. So it opens up again. You know, you get an eddy deposit, and this is a big gravel bar. There's a gravel pit, you know. And then this is mostly lake silt kind of wrapping around it. But this is a big eddy bar that I'll mention later. Okay. Okay. The viewers, are, the, view, the viewers are loving this, Larry. The viewers are loving this. Keep it going. This is, this is perfect. You bet. Absolutely. Good. And then we get down to the Clark Fork Flathead River confluence. There's where the lake was. Mm -hmm. Lake is getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And so this confluence is great. There's flood deposits in this in these terraces that have some of the highest permeability. I mean, they get bang up groundwater out of mm. out of those deposits there. Mm. Mm -hmm. And Paradise, I recommend everybody, if you're in the neighborhood, go to the Paradise in the summer and go to their museum there. They have ah. a beautiful little Glacial Lake Missoula Museum. Ah. Um, and there's the classic Paradise um, Eddy Bar yeah. back up in the tucked up in the valley. Yeah. And this is the kind of stuff that um, was preserved that um, um, JT Party mapped. Okay, and I, there's plains, you know, here we're in the Northwest area. I'm, I'm kind of skipping by a few things, but that's sure. okay. Sure, sure. Oh, oh, no, I crashed it. You did? I crashed it. Yeah, I just I, I had to, but I accidentally clicked just slightly wrong. 
<laughs> Give me a second. Give me a yeah, second. You're fine. We got all the time in the world. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I okay. This is good enough. Yep. Um, Route Creek is a town there. And here's where I had mapped the ice dam in this representation. Um, good old Roy Breckenridge. You know, mm -hmm. hopefully you have uh, Roy Breckenridge, unfortunately, passed away a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I went on field trips with him and talked to him of some. He's thinking that that ice dam made it at least a Trout Creek at various times. Oh, really? So it terminated at various places, and he's got a stratigraphic arguments for it. And I had this master's student, and I'm, I'm pretty sure we have a good ice dam location here near, um, um, it's I'm blank Bull Creek. Bull, mm -hmm. Bur, Bur, our Bull Creek comes in, okay. and so there are various positions over time of where that ice dam was. So yeah. if you can imagine, if the ice is all the way up here, not like, you know, pre uh, William Morris Davis was thinking, you know, the ice made it everywhere. Oh. Um, <laughs> that's a big hunk of ice dam because here's you know Ponderay Lake Ponderay and so you would imagine the earlier ice dams for the bigger floods were probably bigger okay but once you fill up that lake you know uh, at some point uh, it's going to fail you know yeah. you just you can't hold back you know infinity with ice so anyway just a little geography very good Let's take a look at this stuff here. Um, Burgess Lake Eddy Bar. Um, I call it, that's what I call it. But this is classic in Part E42, this Eddy Bar. But there's also this Colk Lake right here, mm. a little Burgess Lake that was probably formed during a catastrophic flood. So here's the Mission Valley. I've kept it to the Polson Moraine. I'm going to give you a tidbit here. Good. I was working on a drilling project for groundwater, you know, after I retired up in the Flathead Valley. And we were trying to trying to uh, characterize the confining unit between the deep, the deep and the shallow aquifers. And that confining unit is till and lake deposits. Mm. We cored 200 feet of lake deposits up there. I counted 2000 varves ish and we got a carbon-14 date of 15.6 thousand years. Hmm. So this was, it's old enough to be Lake Missoula, way the heck up in the Flathead Valley oh, yeah, at 15.6. So, you know, the, the, I think, you know, as uh, our friend Sky says, you know, it may have been all the way down here, you know, in the Mission Valley. It was at the Pulse of Moraine for a good amount of time because that's yeah. a big topography. But it pulled back maybe all the way up the Flathead Valley, you know, before Holocene time. Hmm. I thought that was way cool. Well, I well, yeah. I mean, if, if you don't mind me butting in for just a sec, looking at this image, like if, if Sky does his mapping south of Polson and he's got potentially stage four or even stage six moraines, and I don't, I, I think he's wondering about that, then would you need a lake south of that stage six moraine, just based on the geometry and geography that's there? It kind of depends on the sedimentology. I see. You know, how were those sediments deposited? If they were ice contact to land, deposits yeah. you know that's what we think of as till right then you don't need a lake but if they're big sheet debris flows that look like they were deposited in a lake uh, then you'd need a lake I so see. it kind of depends on the sedimentology i'd say okay. thank you um, and I, i'm not an expert on the mission valley i've spent literally days mapping here not you know, weeks or even a field season. So. Sure. Okay. It's Sounds a big area. Good. It's it 11, is. 11,000 square kilometer lake, you know. That's, that's a lot of ground to cover, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially when you're not really getting, that's not the point of my employers paying me. Um, <laughs> okay. 
everybody knows Camas Prairie, I hope, and Perma. Yes. But well, it's so there's, a, I think, you know, there was Brett's notes talk about the nice little Perma Delta. There's great evidence for flood deposits coming down in very, all these little tucked in these valleys. It's not a big surprise because you've got the uh, Camas Prairie dune field, you know, the ripples, but Vic Baker would tell you those aren't ripples, they're dunes. Okay. Coming through Markle Pass, oops, Markle Pass, mm -hmm. um, and this, uh, these other passes, you know, various, um, and, but this is pretty high level lake, you know, and then there's a, been a lot of good work by other people on this. Um, showing that these were high energy, you know, maybe anti-dunes in places, um, if that means something to people. Those are, that's a lot, that's fast flow of yeah. water. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so the lake was here. So at high stands of the lake, you know, they're just, uh, I, I, I'm gonna, oh, Larry, 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 I screwed up again. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. No Just problem. Give me a no minute. problem. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this well, is what we would do. Well, I'll talk to the viewers for just a sec, Larry, while you get it queued up again. So, yeah. so Larry's giving us all sorts of detail to go along with these visuals, viewers, and that is a real treat to have that. And I, I can already see there's a bunch of questions that you have. So I think once we get past the movie and maybe a handful more slides from Larry, I'm probably going to go right to you, the viewers. So get your get your questions ready, and uh, we'll just have a nice session with you going directly to Larry because this is such a known topic, and many of you have long-lasting questions about this concept, and who better to answer your questions than our guest today? So um, be, be ready for that, uh, guests, uh, viewers. Okay, Larry, we'll be back to go to finish this movie out. Good. Yep. Great. I'm just going to point out this is the Little Bitterroot Valley. Okay. And uh, I had a student working way at the end of that, and he found a canyon with flood deposits in it. Oh. And it was so cool <laughs> that Brett saw that in 1929. And he's he came up with the same interpretation we did. Oh, wow. On, on what, how that canyon formed during okay. a... And that's giving more water into this little bitterroot than we previously thought. Mm -hmm. Of course, Rainbow Lake, uh, they thought it was, you know, till dammed. But this is the the high first spillage, big flow, Hulk Lake. So this is Scabland topography. Mm -hmm. It's a short circuit. You're going downhill really fast from... Um, a little bit of route into the plains area by going through Rainbow Lake. I see. And I'm just going to let this let this run because it's getting it, it um, near the end. Sure, sure. So we're going to zoom back out and just take one other spot. Okay. I'm going to go back to Missoula. Let's going to go up the Clark Fork um, to my little spot that everybody that drives I-90 knows this spot. And now maybe I'll show you what you're seeing. <laughs> I'm calling it the Garden Gulch area. I published okay. a couple papers on this. There's a, um, this is an old meander scar that was cut off in 1894, I think by uh, the railroad. Okay. And there's a wonderful outcrop of Lake Missoula silts there. It is the one of the highest elevations, so therefore the deepest lake silts. Mm. That's it for this um, okay. little move. Well, let's. can we do a Cochise and get off of the shared screen for just a sec? You bet. And um, that was a real treat. Thank you. Can I ask you a couple of quick questions and maybe we'll go to a few live viewer questions and then we'll go back to your slides or maybe a couple of their questions will prompt you to go back to your slides. But um, I'm sure. struggling. I'm struggling with some basics here and I'm sure you've heard all these questions before. You've got these fine silts in certain places. You have these coarse high energy gravels in other places, but in some cases, both of those deposits are in the same little valley floor, the, the, the high energy gravels and the fine silts. 
it's more than just a big flood and then some quiet water later on. How many generations of drainings or what are you? No, let me try this one instead. How many different drainings with those high energy coarse gravels do you think you have? Or is that not the focus of your sedimentology work on the floor of the lake? I wish I knew. Okay. Um, I really think that those coarse, those huge bars, the Tarkio bar, yeah. they must have taken multiple floods to deposit that much gravel there. But I have no, um, I tried, but yeah. on the last bit, I tried to date upstream and downstream on this gravels we'll get to, yeah. and it didn't work. Yeah. Um, uh, it all came up with one age. They could have all been one, yeah. but it's really hard to understand. Um, it just seems like there's multiple f big floods that are depositing those gravels. And then, you know, the silts came in later and those lakes must have been either smaller or the ice dam failed in a different way that was not as catastrophic. Are all of your silt beds that you've studied carefully younger than one or multiple big drainings with the gravels? No. Oh, okay. Uh, the silt beds at Garden Gulch are older than the gravel I, de I dated. Got so it. that's cool. So, yeah. But yeah. it's because, and I'll get to this, but it's because it's up in a very protected area. There wasn't a whole lot of water upstream of it. And I think it, it um, preserved those silts. Okay. But downstream, yeah. once you get yeah. to Missoula, yeah. all those silts are younger. So they're time transgressive. If it's a geologic unit, you would say it's a time transgressive geologic unit. Yeah. Thank you for that. Let's let's do a handful of questions from the viewers, and then we'll go to the there, slides. Uh, there's I don't a know bunch you, of them. Yeah, there are. <laughs> you, you can certainly grab what you like as well, but I, I'll grab Brandon's question. Do you have an idea on how fast or slow Lake Missoula filled and drained? No, but there's been a lot of back-of-the-envelope calculations on filling. Well, you know, the, other, other people have... We, we've I've been involved in some hydraulic modeling, and I'm trying to do some more with a colleague in Tucson. And it looked like through that area I've been concentrating on, it pretty much drained in like two or three days mm. uh, through that. Um, but as for filling, and uh, Jim O'Connor, you know, did a back of the envelope calculation just with the modern st stream flow. If you stop the Clark Fork River at Ponderé, that lake could fill up in 60 years. 60. You know, even under the 60 years under yeah. modern climate. Who knows, yeah. you know, 20,000 years ago. But. Thank you. Mark wonders does Flathead Lake predate Lake Missoula or is it strictly a remnant? I think it's strictly a remnant that from looking at all the well logs that we did in back in 2000, so there's been more since, that we could map a, an old stream channel, which is an aquifer at the bottom of the, below the lake deposits that showed through drainage in that area that due to the construction of the Polson Moraine, and then where the low spot was, the Flathead River went over a bedrock ledge. And so it's been held up by bedrock. But previously, I think it just flowed through uh, a different gap due south. Thank you. Charlie wonders, uh, Larry, what's that high bench above Dayton, Montana? Um, on the ridge, that's bedrock. Uh, there's Chief Cliff there, um, which it was uh, eroded with and there's scab land up there by a drainage of a, si a lake that was up near Lake Mary Renan. 
Mm-hmm. And this was done by Daryl Smith, 1970s, his master's student. You know, I've talked to Daryl. He's since passed away, but um, really did a wonderful job. Not my work. Um, that there were these side drainages and then there was a catastrophic drainage of that little side lake through there that causes that topography. But the ridge itself was, it gets above the, the highest uh, uh, Lake Missoula, I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure. I, mm-hmm. I don't remember the heights. Let's do two more and then we'll go to more slides. Uh, Can Larry. I bring up one? Go for Somebody it. Yeah. came by and say, what is the evidence for these ice dam locations? Good. That's a really good question. Because, okay. And it's been somewhat controversial, but uh, Roy Breckenridge, it, he never published this because he was he, he worked in Idaho, but he couldn't resist coming into Montana and he couldn't put it on his Idaho maps. I was trying to work with him that we could, uh, but he died. Um, anyway, there's evidence of glacial um, outwash deposits that are headed sideways or um, upstream, which is would be away from the ice margin. And this is tucked up on the side canyons because everything in the middle got washed out. Right. And he saw this in a number of places. Um, and I think it's pretty, it's really good evidence that there was a ice mass to the downstream that was shedding sediment upstream. Huh. Because if it was a flood deposit, it would either go downstream or up the side canyons. The other thing we saw is, is till. Um, till on a constriction with, we, I'm, I really think it's a chunk of till left uh, near um, Bull, uh, Bull River, where it comes into um, uh, Clark Fork River, upstream from Heron. Um, well, how were those deposits? One. How were those deposits interpreted before by previous workers? Were they also <laughs> seeing a nice dam there? They were wonderfully mapped by Harrison and others with the USGS as a pile of undifferentiated gravel. Okay. When you're interested in the bedrock, we uh-huh. did a beautiful mapping of it. I said, Q U. <laughs> I, <laughs> I love know it. why you, you know, bedrock <laughs> yeah. intervention. Right, right. <laughs> uh, one more, a, a quick one probably. Greg wonders when did the lake completely dry up? Prior to the eruption of the glacier peak G Tefra which is about 13,500. Some other folks have, there's some really nice uh, till units um, near Pond Array, near Sandpoint that were dated with uh, exposure dating. And they were right around 14,000, 14, you know, three. Um, but it, we know it, the lake was gone by the time the glacier peak Tafra blew off because you see it in terraces way, you know, just a little bit above the drainages. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Let's try a few slides, Larry, and then we'll, viewers, we'll come back to your questions uh, at the end of uh, Larry's slides, but he's got a few more ready for us, including a little bit about, a, a little bit more about how he gets these, these dates. I think at least one slide talking about that. So go ahead and share, Larry, if you can. Okay. And, uh, you're oh, doing I'm great. Back. I'm back to there, but I'll just, oop, oop. Okay, there was the movie. Yep. Um, and I'm just going to open it up. <laughs> Thought I was going to open it up. Um, there was the movie. Okay, this is at Tarkio. Mm-hmm. If we remember the big, my favorite gravel bar. Yes. Um, that actually that's just, I'm looking north. And so the gravel bar is way past the blue sky. And it's been, this is, the gravel bar had moved downstream. Mm -hmm. And so these are, you have to believe me, uh, (laughs) there are slip faces in these gravels. You kind of get a taste of them up here. And this is a jumble of well-cemented gravel. Um, but 
you get a taste of them here and then bing they're truncated by and overlying lake deposits mm. and so this was from my 2006 paper this is a slam dunk that there were more than one lake mm. okay it it just has to be yeah. that you had a big lake that failed catastrophically you deposited these huge cross beds and then the lake came back in and somehow this gets planed off i mean that's part of the story too is it just right. by the the gravel bar moved down and during floods it was planed or or whatever yeah um and then there's a whole bunch of lake deposits up here and i've gotten some dates from here but i've never published that huh. uh this is along the old Mil milwaukee rail line okay uh, so it's it's public, it's state land up in here. Yeah. Um, so this is wide open for people to visit. Uh, yeah. You're not you don't tread on private land, and the private landowner that lives across the street is wonderful. Nice. Um, they're way into the glacial lake Missoula, so that's good to know. But you don't have to get on their property. Cool. Uh, I think it should be preserved personally. I think. Yeah. So this is evidence for multiple lakes. That's mm -hmm. my. And here's just another shot of big flood deposits. And this is looking downstream, but we're in Trout Creek, which is kind of near Superior, Montana. It doesn't matter where, but the um, glacial, uh, uh, Clark Fork River is way off to the right and goes downstream that way. Trout Creek goes all the way up to into Idaho. It's a little side drainage. And so this is showing gravel being shed away from the um away from the clark fork river valley when a flood's going down it's spreading sediment up these side tributaries and these are places where it can be well preserved unfortunately this this outcrop isn't as good now as it used to be huh. that's my old car yeah i got a question about the gravels larry um yep so i get that the size of the class mean that we have high energy and, and we're draining a big lake but Where's the gravel coming from? Good question. This this gravel here, this is actually pretty sandy. So this is a not mm. a huge, probably not a huge uh, energetic deposit. I've been able to trace, it's coming from belt rocks okay. that are in the valley. And most of the bedrock is belt um, various ages of these one point you know, 1.46 billion year old uh, sedimentary rocks. Yeah. Um, but there's also some tertiary deposits that are kind of not really well consolidated. Mm -hmm. And I found boulders of those tertiary deposits miles downstream from where they could have been ripped out of the, uh, the, the walls of the valley. And that shows this kind of barely cohesive clay sedimentary rock was being carried probably in suspension because mm -hmm. it wasn't beat up at the bottom of a valley. So mm -hmm. you can tie some of it, but the problem, there's no really, or not for me at least, there's not a lot of distinctive lithologies you can show. So this, this little quartzite came from that creek 12 yeah. miles upstream or something. Right, 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 right. Thank you. It, it, I assume it came, they came out of, you know, the, when it's a happy, you know, happy regular old stream system, it's got terraces and it's got, you know, um, valleys, bottom sediments and all that gets picked up and moved, you know, oh. in the floods. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a wildly vertically exaggerated cross section showing, you know, maximum lake level from near the Garden Gulch section way up to uh, Gold Creek, Montana. That's basically where the shoreline was. All the way down to the ice dam, basically Idaho, Montana borders here. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine this pile of ice was probably even thicker than that. Huh. And so there's the Garden Gulch and then this little, whatever this color is, brown, um, green, whatever it is, I'm, I'm colorblind. Um, it shows that sediment uh, thickness of the Garden Gulch is way up there. And then there's, didn't talk about this, but the nine mile section, you know, places in the Missoula Valley. Here's the Tarkio Bar. 
St. Regis, Plains, you know, this is where you see those glacial lake silt and clay. But there's those three, those three big bars. Yeah. That last eddy bar I showed near St. Regis, the Tarkio bar, and this is that eddy bar downstream from Sear. But there's another one up in here too that I've huh. mapped since I made this slide. And it, again, I, I think it, the nice thing is, is these, these bars kind of correlate and they're, they're pseudo parallel to the modern drainage channel. And uh, it's showing that this was one big flood that deposited this set of, these set of bars. And these would tie in fine with everything Pardee did downstream. I see. You know, I, I didn't add that his to it. I plotted those two and they, they work out great. Yeah. But yeah. then you've got the silt and clay kind of laying in between. And there's those, there's imbricated boulders I was talking about too uh -huh. down there. Uh -huh. It kind of pulls it together. Talk a little more about the garden gulch section, because okay. again, I've tried, this is not the only place, but I've tried to look the farthest up towards, the, you know, as far as you could get towards the maximum lake level, look for a section because they're, they, they could be older. Huh. And here's that garden gulch section again, you yeah. know, cut off meander loop. Um, if you stand on the freeway and take a panorama photo without, you know, standing right next to the traffic, um, <laughs> this is what it looks like. Yeah. And everybody that goes by there sees, you know, look at this layering, but you know, look at this, there, there's something going on here. You know, there, what does this all mean? So I spent a lot of time digging these trenches sure. and measuring a section. I didn't repel. That would be the next thing to do is to rope up and work vertically. But, you know, I'm working by myself and I, I don't like, I don't like roping up. Understandable. So I, so I worked up a section and all the way up to the top. And I want to show you some pictures of what I did. And each of these little holes, that's where I took an optically stimulated luminescence or uh -huh. optical dating sample. Okay. And I did 17 or 18. This is what it looks like when you really clean it off. And oh, this is only wow. about a meter. Huh. Okay. So what you see are beautifully laminated glacial lacustrine deposits with that get all messed up. And then boom, there's another sequence, another cycle of uh, deposition. So I way I interpret this is the lake was depositing these sediments. The lake went down, mm -hmm. okay? The lake level went down, either it drained or the lake level lowered, hard to tell from this site. Okay. And it was exposed to um, permafrost or, or paraglacial action, huh. disturbing the snot out of these. Let me tell you, it took me years to realize this is what was happening here. <laughs> because it takes a lot of work to clean off. If you oh, see, this yeah. is like a trench into right. the side. Yeah. And then I then I made a, a little table so I could look down on these things and you know really <laughs> document the three dimensions of these this disturbance. And here's another one. Okay, so I measured this section, nine meters. Um, I would say that nine meter section I measured a few times and I made a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. I just made a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. I had to go back and redo it. I got lost in the middle because you're always jumping over to some other place and not, anyway, it took me years, years yeah. to make this section. And I, each of these um, arrows are a cycle boundary. So that's where I interpreted that the lake went down and this is, you know, one of the most photogenic, it's this one at around two meters. Sure. And you can map out all the little, all the little things going on. But what I really was interested in was this stuff, because that's sandy. So I pound a tube into here. I pounded yeah. a tube into there, but it broke. I never <laughs> did get that tube out. Um, I got better at this over yeah. time. Yeah. Pounded a tube in there and got 19.8 plus or minus one and a half thousand years for that. Huh. Okay. And it's paraglacially modified laminated silt 
and clay with a little bit of sand, not a lot of sand. And I had, I was really dependent on finding sand grains to map, to uh, measure with optical dating. Huh. Okay? Yep. What is optical dating? Thank you. Okay, this is, I stole this off the internet. I'll give you the, the but uh, I'll give the reference here in a minute. Think about little Sandy the sand grain. It, little Sandy erodes out of some outcrop somewhere and it's getting, then it gets buried. And over time, the optical, uh, it, okay, when the sand grain, it gets exposed to the sun, it, and let's just talk quartz, in minutes, in minutes, it'll be bleached. You know, all the radiation damage will be um, erased from that sand, sand grain. Mm -hmm. Then it gets buried. And over time, it's being affected by radiation, natural radiation, and it builds up its optical um, luminescence to some point. And then it gets eroded, you know, in some along the stream and transported, and it loses some or all of its, um, of its stimul of its luminescence. In this case, it didn't lose it all. So it got partially bleached. And then it gets built up again, you know, between 10 and, you know, 100,000 years, or whatever, <clears throat> gets eroded again, and it's getting alpha, beta, gamma radiation. And here it gets reset. It truly gets totally bleached and then gets buried again, you know, up to here or uh, to here. And then, the you know, Jolene, the geologist, goes out there and grabs <laughs> Sandy um, and brings him to the lab and measures how much luminescence occurred at that point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here's Mallison. I really like his little description. Yeah. And so when you bury this, here's a buried horizon, let's say, you know, it's in transport, some of it's getting bleached, but in the big catastrophic floods, uh, it's not getting bleached much. You're really dependent on being near land surface. But cosmic rays also penetrate. You have to account for that. But it's getting alpha, beta, and gamma uh, radiation. Free, you know, Feldspar has potassium in it. So there's a lot of radiation coming out of that. There's uranium. There's you know, all these. Uh, it's getting radiated. Okay. And then you go out and either core it somehow, and you take it, you pound these tubes in, and when you pull it out, the stuff in the middle of the tube has never seen light since it was deposited. And you sample that and you measure how much, you know, radiation, how much, what's the signal? How bright is it? Mm -hmm. But then for every one of those little pieces, you calibrate, you do an internal calibration for everyone. So you take that same little sample, you know, however many grains and you, it, once you've measured it, it's bleached. So then you, expose it to a known amount of radiation and measure it again and then it's bleached and then you expose it to a known amount of radiation again and you build up these calibration curves for every one and so based on that original signal you say the de the estimated dose is let's say 21 grays and that's mm -hmm. a unit of radiation mm -hmm. um and then if you have that and you know, you also sample this and how, how radioactive is this sediment? You need to know that. Then with that, the amount of radiation divided by the dose rate gives you an age because hmm. it's all calibrated per thousand years. Mm -hmm. That's basically what you do. You sample the sediment or rock, sample the surrounding uh, material, prepare samples, not trivial, to isolate potassium or quartz, yeah. measure the ionizing radiation in your in the group. How hot is it? Uh, Montana's hot, which is handy. Um, and measure the amount of luminescence sample and calculate an edge. So I did this a bunch of times. I went on sabbatical over there for five months and did this work the first time. Then I've been over there three times since. 
So here's that nine meters at Garden Gulch and error bars. There's always error bars. Sure. A couple, there's a few that are anomalously old. Makes perfect sense. For whatever reason, those sediments were not well exposed to, um, and we can measure this, but I don't want to get into details. Yep. I, we're convinced that we had a few that are anomalously old. But the, the sand, regular old, you know, uh, river sand at the bottom was right around, you know, 19 to 22,000 years. But all the, you got to always believe error bars when they overlap, the ages are the same. But it's amazing that most of the sediments were about 21,000 years. Mm -hmm. So it shows all these exposure surfaces is at least up to here. Things get bonkers up here. I don't know. And I'll <laughs> never know. Somebody else can do the work. What's going on at the top. Yeah. We're all about 21,000 years. So this is yeah. old. Okay. But it, the lake changed multiple times. Doesn't mean it went all the way down, but it might have. Mm. You know, I, I can't say that. Mm -hmm. Lake filled to near to greater than 65% of full capacity at least 11 times. More fluctuations occurred by when the lake went away. Huh. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. What am I doing? Did I? How many more slides have you got, Larry? I just a couple. Just, okay. I, I, I've got four more. Okay. Some outcrops. Yep, let's do it. I, I just hit the wrong button. I'm not. It's okay. It's nice to see I, your face I, again, Larry. Where did I lose Zoom, my Zoom bar? Well, we're um, still functional. I can still see you and hear you. <laughs> Viewers, get your questions ready while while uh, Larry looks for his last four slides. I'm fumbling. I'm He's fumbling. fumbling. You can you can fumble. I, <laughs> this this is a this is a, a, a nurturing place, Larry. I fumble with the best of them half the time. So if you find I've what you need, my, Brit, my bar that says share. Okay, well maybe we can live without those last four slides and just talk okay. a little bit. Yeah, it's just some outcrops and stuff. Okay, and I lost I lost you. I don't know where your face is. But, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you are. I found okay. you. Okay. Okay. I could, I could share. I'm going to share again just because Good. Yeah. I live. I want to just because I want to just be, Hey, this is your show, baby. Let's, let's go. Larry, uptown Larry. Oh, do you let's see do my, it. my figure again. We, we can okay. see it. Yep. We're back okay. in business. So just to, to wrap up. Yep. Remember that gravel quarry that I was talking about. This is my last paper that came out. April Fool's Day of 23. Um, <laughs> this is what you see in that gravel quarry. Ah. Big old cross beds. Good God. And they, go, they go for a thousand feet from upstream to downstream. And this is what the owner, just wonderful, told me about. And so here I am out at 930 at night in like May or June, and the owner is digging me a pit. <laughs> and we're exposing in this pit more gravel for me to take to Denmark to go <laughs> measure. You can do, you don't need just sand grains, you can do cobble surfaces. You can do bedrock surfaces with optically stimulated luminescence. Wow. If you want it, the details, that geology paper is no paywall, and it's kind of technical. Okay. Um, but I came up with 18.2 thousand years, plus or minus 1.8 mm -hmm. for the age of this deposit. And that was based on rocks from different pits at different locations. So I mm. can't say um, it's older in one direction. But remember, if you're dating a cobble, and this has been done for till, people yeah. have done this in in in. Europe for till, and this is new. It's probably the way of the future. Um, this cobble was exposed to sunlight before it was being transported. It was sitting out there on a terrace or you know stream bar somewhere, and then picked up and moved. And so you're going into this place where there's a billion billion rocks, and you're taking thirty of them out of there and yeah. hoping 
that a few of those rocks were exposed to sun before they were deposited, huh. before they were transported. So I looked at 38 rocks and I got good dates from three of them. Huh. Um, and it took like six weeks of work in the lab. No kidding. Um, anyway, it was very exciting. That's why we were able to publish this in geology. Uh, it really is, um, you can date, there's no sand in this deposit. This is all gravel. The sand has been carried all the way to the Pacific Ocean or wherever. It's been carried out to the Channel Scabland. This is all gravel. Huh. <laughs> and so when you're given this kind of deposit, you can still get a date uh, from those. Wow. If you're willing to do the work. Right. And then to find the last slide, here's the nine mile section. This is um, Michelle Hansen and others work. They got a date of about 15,000 at the bottom of this. We know this was done by 13.7, 13.5 by Glacier Peak. So this is clearly younger than the gravel at the top. But we kind of knew that being rational scientists anyway. But here's the numbers at least. Okay, that's it. Beautiful job. Beautiful job. Here. Thank you. Okay. We're, we're, we're so grateful to you for that. You've, you've done this with so many different groups and so many different venues, but it's, it's, a, it's a real treat. So thanks. Viewers, we are coming to you. I've got, I've got two things I want to ask. One is, that's a promising dating technique. How far back in time can we go if we have a, a deposit we think is much older than 20,000 years ago, let's say, I don't know, Larry, let's say in the Spokane area, um, can we use that OSL with something older than 50,000 years ago? Yes. Is anybody the doing thing that? Is, you can't use quartz. Quartz, quartz gets, um, uh, the, 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 my brain is not functioning right. Um, it gets saturated. Yeah. You know, once you ex once you uh, radiation so give it so much radiation damage, it saturates so it flatlines and you don't get a good date. But feldspar, and there's various techniques of using feldspar. Some of the saturations may go back to nine hundred thousand years, um, and this is all research. E all this is researchy. It's right. not like you could just go with carbon fourteen and send to a lab. They give you a date back. Right. Um, that's unfortunately optical is not that way. But there's a lot of people that do it. Um, there's some really good people at the USGS that do it, and and Tammy at you know Utah State and Olav up uh, Simon Fraser there or uh, Fraser Valley. Um, but the feldspar work and. and there's a number of papers, and I, I sent you a couple. Yeah. Um, I know there's better ones. I just didn't, I didn't, I couldn't find them right off. No, that, that really show that you can get into middle Pleistocene. No, no doubt. Um, well, that is and, a huge shock to my system. Is, yeah, go ahead. The thing is, and if you've got LUS, that's wonderful because, you know, uh, aeolian sediments, you know, windblown sediments are exposed to the light. And the problem is with this, to get an older date, th these are really stable um, radiation damage. And to be that stable, that means it takes a long time exposed to the sun to bleach. And so they have to be very well bleached sed sediments. So um, that's th the problem is you have to document the bleaching. Um, but they've had really good dates. I, I remember the one article that Jan Peter did back to 440,000 years. You're kidding uh, and me. this is mostly Chinese. Look at the Chinese lusts, you know, the huge lusts in China. They, that's where the a lot of good work is being done. Well, it's so exciting because let's say that there's new rounds of work on the scab lands investigating some of these older stories for whatever reason. If this technique is real and it exists, I know of nobody doing any OSL stuff older than 100,000 years ago in the Northwest. Mm -hmm. Maybe you do. I, but n now that I just think of this, we had an I know you've only seen a couple of these episodes in this series, Larry, but before Christmas we had 
Kelsey Stanton on from the Washington Geological Survey, or, or maybe the last week in December, and she was doing some work way over by Aberdeen and Hoquiam on the Washington coast, and she was working with some of these gravels that Bretz was trying to map back in his Puget Lowland days. She had some OSL dates of 130,000 years, I think. So, oh, really? yeah. I mean, this is, I didn't even really think That's about right. it, but like, so that, my God, that could be really where some of this goes um, in the future. Well, I, I, I've hogged up too much time. Let's do a few more questions. Larry's probably got to run pretty soon, and I've got a bunch of letters and other things. You got to, okay, well, let's take our time with Larry then. Uppercase, I'm sure I missed your questions before, viewers. Go ahead and type those in again, please. Oh, Sharon in Malaga. Larry, can we crowdsource dating projects? The big problem is you have to work with a lab, okay? And I've worked some with uh, Olav uh, Leon up at uh, Fraser Valley in BC, a little bit, $1,200 a sample I had to bring to the table. Um, <laughs> but you, uh, Tammy Rittenauer at Utah State, she's she's wonderful she does great work she's swamped i mm. mean yeah she has one or two of the machines that cost a quarter million dollars each uh to do this and uh sometimes it takes you know 18 months to get a sample so you really have to work with a lab that has this equipment uh usgs shannon but she's i can't remember who's running the lab there right off the bat at yeah. denver they're, they got a lot of projects going. Huh. Um, darn it, but uh, a colleague at North Dakota, what, uh, North Dakota State and Fargo or University of North Dakota, I can't remember which, they shut, down the, they shut down the department. And he had to go, he has a lab, and he was looking for someplace to go. <laughs> you know, it, most of these, that's the problem is, the reason I go to Denmark is that's where they make the machines and they got, I was a visiting scientist and I got to use all this stuff for free. Wow. It didn't cost me anything other than travel and stay there. Wow. Um, the, the, and China is, God, they bought so many machines. I mean, they'd probably be the ones to work with, but they're doing all this work. There aren't that many labs. I see, interesting. Let's keep it going. Uh, we just need a million, we need a billionaire to give us a, one at Ellensburg, Ellensburg, Washington, <laughs> Optical Lab, you know, J. Harlan Brett's lab of knowledge. Now you're dreaming. To be <laughs> full disclosure, I'm on the first floor. For, for all I know, there is one up on the third floor right now. I never get up there. I have no idea what's in those rooms. Uh, David, who's a state parks ranger at Dry Falls, wonders, what's your answer for the estimated time between each filling and draining of Glacial Lake Missoula? What do you tell people, Larry? I as yeah, I appreciated when Sky said, I am conservative. I only talk about stuff I know yep. or can at least support. Yep. I don't even know how many times Glacial Lake Missoula filled. You know, I really don't. Uh, Brian Atwater, you know, these folks downstream and the, you have a better idea on how many times they filled and drained. I'm not even sticking my head towards how many times it filled and drained, let alone, yeah, how long it takes. Fair enough. Moving on. Uh, Bill in Portland wonders, what's your favorite mechanism for the dismantling of the ice dam? You want to pass on that one too? Well, I mean, I'm again not my not my yep. specialty. Yep. I'm a tourist, right? But, uh, hydraulic fracturing, you know, you get too much water pressure. I can't. I worked in the oil industry. For, that's not my true love, but it was a great job. Hydraulic fracturing, boy, you pump up fluid pressure. You got a weak rock, and it it breaks. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you, Saber wonders. Can you date the strand lines on the hills? I would hope so. The problem is finding them. They look so obvious from a distance. Yeah. You walk up that hill and you go, "Where? what am I looking at? I don't, right. I don't, I don't see a strand line. Right. Um, 
I'm hoping with better mapping of the strand lines, we're going to find some really good places to go. Huh. And I'll back up even one. Yeah. What did the strand line mean? You know, what do each of those mean? Is it a seasonal fluctuation? Is that wintertime, spring runoff? Wintertime, spring runoff. Or is it a full lake? Or uh, what else? I don't know. Or are, they, they are they erosional or depositional? Seems like I get different answers yeah. even on that. Are they not they're are they not just cut into erosion. the hill or are they berms? They're erosional. Yeah, that's a, that's another one to you know, there's places yeah. you could they have to be depositional, but you gotta find those. Huh. John wonders, did Brett's notes surprise you and how? I didn't even know he made it up here. You know, that's the one thing. Um and he was very, I haven't read them all. I mean, yeah. I, I. There's a lot. There's a lot. Uh, yeah. He was very perceptive. I wish I could take that good of notes because it, clearly he was doing that every day. It was almost like, was he sitting there with his typewriter or, you know, he was writing it out and then, um, it, it, you know, and then to read it, you know, on one day, then he's rethinking what he wrote the previous day. So, you know, that was, you know, he was actively involved in writing that stuff down. And to find the little canyon, at the, the little bit of root, little bitter root river is uh, weird drainage. And I think it was established at around 18,000 years ago in that big flood. It, because it's, it's got waterfalls on it. You know, it's got these canyons. It, it did a lot of work. Um, and I... I was surprised. He said, oh, yeah, it, well, it looks like a big overflow channel. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, good, thanks. <laughs> he was there for one day, and well, well, I had a student work all summer. <laughs> well, that, that's a theme of this, I think. Like, almost everybody that reads these notes go, yeah, I could have swore I was the only person that knew about this one little spot, and I'm just, like, doing recon, and here's this guy, yeah, eating a ham sandwich in 1928, and like, oh, yeah, obviously it's an overflow channel. <laughs> He's seen like, a lot. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the thing that really gets me is the best yeah. geologists, you know, we can all call ourselves geologists or see the most stuff, yep. you know, we get around. How about three more? Oh, Sky Cooley has a question. Oh. E evidence for 40 floods leaving the Glacial Lake Missoula Basin? Question mark. Sure. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, again, I'm concerned. Yeah. Okay, what I really hang myself on are there the really big ones, and that could easily be multiple. And then the really late ones, and I'm not the first person to say that, there was no flood. The last lake drained like, mm. because that's where we see the, the sediments preserved near Heron, Montana, right? I mean, 15, now there's a big reservoir there that messes everything up. But down in the valley there, you know, you're right near the border. How do you preserve those? You, that lake just, the last drainage was very quiet. Huh, I interesting. Think. And yeah. maybe a few times, I don't know. Kenneth in Sandpoint, uh, everyone says no biologic matter in Glacial Lake Missoula sediments or deposits. Uh, Kenneth thinks he has sticks from Nine Mile. So is it as rare as it sounds like to have uh, okay. some six sticks or something? I've dated those. Okay. They came out dead. They are greater than 45,000 years old. I paid for a date out of the last dregs of grant money I had. And um, unfortunately, it's probably related to, um, I got to I got a phone, but anyway, um, <laughs> it's probably related to, there's a lot of um, coal or lignite available in the drainage basin and that gets retransported. And we've, on this corn project, we also dated a bunch of things that come out dead. And mm -hmm. I, luckily the USGS supported me a little bit years ago, didn't get one carbon 14 date out of that stuff. So mm. just because you see black organic material doesn't mean it was living at the same time as I, there's got to be fossils in the lake sediments. Nobody's uh -huh. really looked. 
like yeah. ostracots or you know, nobody's looked huh. that I know of. You know. Huh. All right, well, I'll take the last one, and this may sound radical, but I don't know. I guess I had the thought when I looked at those incredible gravel piles that you were showing late in that slideshow. When we got to those last four slides and those cross beds and the incredible gravels, is it possible we're catastrophically filling Glacial Lake Missoula as opposed to catastrophically draining it? Is there any chance that that stuff subglacially coming out from under the ice sheet to the north? You are a long way from the ice sheet in Nine Mile. That okay. is a long way. There's no direct connection except over Evro Hill, which is, you know, water depth was about that much. Mm. Um, mm. The, you know, there's so, there are uh, valley glaciers, there's mountain glaciers coming in, but not the ice sheet. Huh. Um, that's huh. the beauty in that southern part. Is it yeah. Being, well, except, except up you know, but you're caught kind of way upstream in the um, at this Blanchard Creek section I've worked on um, near Ovando. There you've got the ice sheet nearby, but that's that's a long way from uh, uh, nine mile. Well, yeah, I'm on Mars half the time, and I'll, I don't know. The first step is geography, you know, and if you don't quite know where you are with some of these places, it's hard to put the things together. That's why we have interviews with folks who know. So that's why Google Earth is awesome. <laughs> yes, it is. It really is. Larry, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. It's been a real treat. You said we wanted to schedule this because you were heading on a big trip a little bit later this month. Where are you headed? Chile. Hey. Just for fun. Hey. I'm going to go climb a volcano and other things. You got the right idea. I think you know how to live. That's a great thing. <laughs> thank you very much, Larry. We'll talk to you next time. I need to close okay. Zoom out, right? Yep, okay. absolutely. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. That was Larry Smith from Butte, Montana, a retired geology professor, Montana Tech, and a good guy who spent a lot of time studying those deposits. I mean, the level of detail and patience necessary with some of those deposits. I mean, uh, I don't know what struck you with those slides in Larry's uh, presentation, but to me, one of the things that struck me is that he's drilling deep. He's on his hands and knees for weeks getting that level of detail. And I, I at the same time, thinking of Brett's, who's just constantly on the move. And, and thinking on a much broader scale. There's room for both of those kinds of approaches, obviously. And uh, really fun to learn from Larry directly. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, you would think that I would say goodbye. Thanks for tuning in. And in past winters, that has been the case, that we would interview somebody. I'd say a couple of quick final words and we'd be done. But this winter is different. So, of course, I've got a bunch of olden day letters and, and uh, improved photos from past shows and all sorts of things. So um, this is easily going another half an hour, maybe even more. If you're willing to stick with us, are we five by five? Why I transition to what I want to do, share with you. Believe it or not, I had a hundred slides of old documents and old letters fired up and ready to go. And I caught myself middle of the morning. I'm like, I can't show a hundred of these things today. So my challenge is going to be to somehow uh, get this Brett's timeline thing continued in the remaining letters that we have. And occasionally these kind of last hours are going to not really work well with the topic that we just talked about. But I want to keep going with this timeline. Thank you. Keep it going, boy, says Fez. Thank you for that encouragement. Okay. All right, I'll have my red shirt on again on Sunday morning for our Bonneville flood discussion with Sean Wilsey from the College of Southern Idaho in Twin Falls. He's familiar to many of you. He has a YouTube channel that has grown exponentially in the last few months, it feels like. Uh, but let's go ahead. I still have uh, more than 900 of you here and hope to keep your attention um, with a bunch of this olden day stuff. Not for everybody, but many of us really dig this stuff. 
So let's do it. I think it's mostly slides. Uh, no, let me do a quick docky thing first, get that out of the way, and then we'll do the slides. So if you caught the intro today, uh, this is a beautiful map from Jerry Richmond in 1965, and we're saving this until Session Z uh, to get into the 1960s and Brett's last paper, but I just couldn't hold it. I had to get to some of this now just to reinforce the idea that Brett's never does totally fall in love with Glacial Lake Missoula only for a source of his Ice Age flooding, and we'll see that uh, in the remaining letters that we have. Again, from the early part of today's episode before I brought Larry on, we are continuing to think in the 1920s about Bretz's working hypothesis of subglacial flow underneath a stage six, that's my words, a stage six ice sheet. But remember that we are also playing with the idea, and there's been now, I am happy to report, I was hoping for this, but I wasn't sure it was going to happen. I'm happy to report that now, after every episode, there is a flurry of emails between geologists. And after Sky's show, Jim O'Connor, do you remember him? USGS Jim O'Connor, who was one of the biggest names in the business, uh, was live with us in the Sky Cooley show last weekend, and then he sent this incredibly long, very thoughtful, interesting email to a bunch of us. And so there's been discussion Sunday, Monday, Tuesday between this working group. So there's all sorts of new thoughts, not all in love with what we're talking about, but all these new thoughts that are done by the, the people who have been doing the work for a long, long time. So I was hoping for that. Uh, and I think some of us will be getting together out in the field in the Spokane area, actively working on some of these narratives that you and I have been doing here uh, uh, in this live stream series. For instance, um, <laughs> so I mean, it's almost like I should get a clipboard out and keep track of, of, of what people are thinking among the geologists that are on this email chain. Some totally fine with older, bigger, younger, smaller. A few geologists hate it. <laughs> it's like every time I show this, they're like, are you kidding me? You're still on this? Yeah, I'm still, I'm still rolling with it. Is the older, bigger, younger, smaller story separated by 100,000 years? Is it separated by 50,000 years? Is, is there hardly any hiatus between the older, older bigger, younger, smaller? I think I kind of heard older, bigger, younger, smaller with Larry today. But that clearly, if that is true, that's clearly happening here, only in the red time, supported by the OSL dates that, that Larry has. I had ambitions earlier in the week, as I was starting to think about this show, to take what I learned from Larry and do a bunch of reading on my own and connect the dots between where the ice dam is located in northern Idaho and the Spokane area and say something rather provocative about the Ice Age flood gravels that make up the majority of the Rathdrum Prairie between Sandpoint and Spokane. I didn't get there. I, I got sidetracked with all this historical stuff, which I'm about to share with you. But the, the concept of this incredible batch of gravels, are those gravels blue? Are they red? Are some blue? Are some red? And I remind you that Jim O'Connor downstream of Wallula Gap has no blue. He's got no blue. There's nothing, not even anything close to blue deposits in the Columbia River Gorge downstream Wallula Gap. So, <laughs> so maybe I'm in a red shirt the rest of the series. I don't know. Okay, that's enough. Let's get to the slides. So we're done with Zoom. Uh, very quickly, as usual, there is a treasure trove of material waiting for you. Pardee's original paper on Glacial Lake Missoula. This guy, William Morris Davis, is going to come up in the letters as a rather key person. Uh, he's got a 1920 paper where he's talking about Glacial Lake Missoula. 1920. 1920. Before Brett starts doing work in the Channeled Scablands, there's 
It's not just Pardee who has a Glacial Lake Missoula paper. Uh, Anderson's talking about the glaciation in northern Idaho, and that will come up a few times in the letters. I'm not going to get here today. That's what I decided this morning. So skip over the 32 publication by Bretz. But here's Part D. That was referred to by Larry a number of times today. This is the 1942 Unusual Currents in Glacial Lake Missoula paper that is a, a very important paper for guys like Larry. Uh, and here's Larry, Larry, Larry. Three Larry papers. And then, yeah, this morning, Larry sent... Yeah, here's just one example of people doing uh, OSL dating going back 180,000 years uh, over in the Pyrenees and over in China as well. So there's, there's all sorts of potential. It slides the rest of the way. Let's do it. And let's get the window nice and big, but not too big. Goldilocks. Tom Foster photo. So, yes. What's the purpose of this timeline? It's mostly to revisit this question. Why was Brett so gosh darn afraid of Glacial Lake Missoula? Why wasn't he publishing on Glacial Lake Missoula all the way through? My hunch is he thought Glacial Lake Missoula was too young for his Spokane flood, and so he just didn't want to go there. And there's reservations even late in his career. But to, to, to say he didn't... To say that Brett's in the 1920s didn't talk about Glacial Lake Missoula because he didn't know about it, uh, I think at this point it's safe to say that's ridiculous. He was well-read. His mentors at Chicago knew about Glacial Lake Missoula. They published on Glacial Lake Missoula. Here's Campbell in 1915, uh, some sort of guidebook going along the Northern Pacific route with a side trip to Yellowstone Park. This is Campbell's map. Look at this thing. Brett's is just starting at the University of Chicago long before his channel Scablands work. Here's a beautiful map of Glacial Lake Missoula. Here's, here's Missoula itself. Here's a portion of the ice sheet coming down to Spokane. Now, this guy doesn't have Brett's Spokane ice south of Spokane like Brett's and Flint do. But here's Lake Missoula. Here's William Morris Davis in 1920. Glacial Lake Missoula, Spokane. We just heard from Larry Schmidt. I, I improved my intro there, obviously. Okay, so uh, I think we're going to skip over that for now. So Pardee had Glacial Lake Missoula figured out. 1942. We got it. Uh, w w I think we've got enough of what we need. The giant current ripples at Camas Prairie. Good. Okay. So, Settle, settle you, you need to get your head right. Do you need to walk around your house and come back? Should I wait for you? You need to get your head right. It's story time. And it's story time by reading a bunch of letters to you. I love this stuff, obviously. And these letters are coming from a combination of sources. And these letters are brand new to everybody. From Vic Baker on down, they are new letters to everybody. I thought maybe they'd be new. They're freaking new, man. I mean, I heard from Vic Baker this morning. He's like, I had no idea about these letters. He was like excited. We're going to share one of Vic's emails to me this morning in the letters. So, I mean, this alone is our major contribution to this discussion. But it's more than just kind of fun little letters that are just kind of adding a little bit of detail here and there. To me, the letters help me see some of Brett's work in a new way, the stuff that he's published. And then, of course, I'm interested in his thoughts on Glacial Lake Missoula and why he didn't publish on it. It's all coming from these letters. So are you ready? Do you need some special glasses or a hat or something to listen to these old letters? And you're like, yeah, I'll get ready for the new letters. Delete. Exit. That's fine. Right, we're down to 869 right now. It's not for everybody. Let's do it. Letters between Brett's and Thomas Large. 
you know, they got their field gear. They both got the beautiful gaiters. They've got the whole thing going on. Well done, boys. And then in their civvies, Harley and Thomas as well. I'm going to use this photo to visually remind you of who's writing letters to who. So here we go between Harley and Thomas. We're going back a ways. March 26, March of 1926. Dear Bretts, I just had a talk with Armstrong. He was the Spokane uh, Chamber of Commerce guy since his return. And he says that you have some errand that you want me to do for you in the Micah locality. That's south of Spokane. I suspect that you said Milan, but he thought it was near Micah. So I'm writing to you for information. Uh, Bretts, this is Thomas. I made the trip to the Lake Ponderé area, and I feel quite sure that my hypothesis regarding that lake is correct. I've been trying for weeks to get that William Morris Davis paper about Montana and Idaho glaciation through the local Spokane library, but shall have to send to, uh, to Nashville for it. I don't want to spill my Ponderé stuff until after I've read it. it Brett, did you notice in the Science Magazine that Princeton's going to have a geological excursion? McMacken, my co-worker at Lewis and Clark High School, is promoting rubberneck wagon expeditions to Grand Coulee. Has the Chamber of Commerce Tourist Committee helping out in Spokane. Has quite a gang for tomorrow and Sunday. Has asked me to go along in one of the buses as assistant spieler. He's talking to Brett's. This is Thomas Large. I've never gotten out there to Grand Coulee, so I'm going to take this opportunity to earn a round-trip passage. And I love this. Here's Thomas Large writing to Brett's. Uh, <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are now approaching the village of Reardon. You will note the longitudinal depression into which we must descend. This is a place where Dr. Brett's let some of the water escape, which was being stored under the ice for the purpose of washing the Grand Coulee. We shall presently see what, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, write me a line when you have time. These guys were buddies. Brett's isn't talking to Flint like that. Brett's isn't talking to somebody else like that. He's talking to specifically Thomas Large with a very colloquial way, a very, very friendly, friendly way. Got uh, fans in the hallway. Okay, keep it, keep it going. April 26. Dear Large, Sometime since you asked me what discount I could secure on a Brunton Compass, uh, best price I can come up with is $22.50. Uh, large, I, I should be, I shall be very much interested in what you have discovered in the Ponderé Valley when you are ready to let the news out. But if you have not read the William Morris Davis paper, you must be sure to see that first. I was interested in the little sketch you sent me that you wrote for the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul Railroad. Apparently, they are going in heavy for geological information because they commissioned me to write them 4,000 words on the geology of the entire train line from Chicago to Seattle. This I haven't yet done and must get at once. That Princeton excursion looks like a little too much, like a dress affair, though I'm interested to see what President Budd of the Great Northern is going to be with them. I originally was requested to send him copies of all the papers I have published on the Columbia Plateau region. And he at least is apparently going to have his eyes open as he goes through. Nevertheless, I think friend McMacken has a better idea for touring the Scabland country. The only trouble being that because buses can't go where the best Scabland is any more than trains can. The errand that uh, Armstrong spoke of deals with the same old assignment that I tried to load on to you some months ago. Remember this with Jerome? Notches on the east-west mountain spur, which is crossed by the Spokane River between Scotia and Camden. A letter from Mr. Ingziger on one of your local banks state that there's a move on foot to make Dry Falls a state park. I sincerely hope that the thing goes through. And if you know of anyone to whom I could write and influence favorably, I shall be glad to do so. Very truly yours, J. Harlan Bretz. Love this map. Remember, this is the one that I colored with an older, bigger blue ice over Spokane by Anderson and a younger, smaller red ice of the true ice dam holding back Glacial Lake, Missoula. Okay, now we got a new character on the, on the scene. 
You do recall in the last show, late, man, the chatter continues. You do remember in the last show that at, towards late with Sky Cooley, we introduced Richard Foster Flint, known as Dick Flint, in these letters. This is a father-son relationship. This is a professor-student relationship. This is Brett's and Flint exchanging letters. Now, I got these from Natalie at the University of Chicago just the other day, and we're going to sprinkle these in as well. And so it may be a dumb choice, but I'm just kind of following a timeline, and I'm using letters between Brett's and Large and then Brett's and Flint, and then Brett's and Isaiah Bowman in New York. And then the months continue. So it's I'm going to show you these photos of Brett's and whomever he's writing with or corresponding with just to keep things straight. It might be a mistake to do it this way. But one of the main points is that Brett's has these regular pen pals, essentially, and he's got a different tone with each person that he's writing to. Of course, we do the same thing. You don't talk to people on the phone the same way universally, right? you got some people you like, some people you're trying to figure out how to hang up on, everything in between. Same thing here. So is Brett's trying to hang up on Flint? I don't know, but, but you'll see the tone is different. I don't know if it's adversarial necessarily, which is the way that this relationship has been poised or presented up to this point. This is the oldest letter I have between Brett's, a professor at University of Chicago, and Richard Foster Flint, a new professor at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. April of 27. Dear Brett's, this is by way of being a letter of introduction for Mr. Freyley Osborne, who is one of our graduate students. He's been doing some regional work with me in the physiography and has become interested in some of the implications of your channeled scab lens problem. Now remember, Flint was an undergrad at the University of Chicago on one of Brett's field courses in the Columbia River Gorge. They climbed Mount Adams together and they were in Hood River. That was the summer of 21 where the field notes weren't that great. And this is just a few, this is six years later. Flint has gone on to get a Ph.D. in geology. Bretz was on his committee. The rumor is that Bretz voted no for Flint to get his Ph.D. I'm not sure we have any evidence for that, but Vic Baker swears that that's the case and that the bad blood started right then between Bretz and Flint. And in case you're unfamiliar, Flint becomes the major critic in, in, in writing in the 1930s. Paper after paper after paper by Dick Flint saying that Brett's is wrong. There is no flood. These are leisurely rivers making the channeled scab lands. So this is the beginning on paper of this relationship, letters that haven't been seen by anybody. I promise not to say that a bunch more. So they're on speaking terms here. Uh, Brett's, I got a grad student, and uh, having done several years of field work in the Canadian survey in various parts of British Columbia, he has a pretty good general idea of the layout in that region. And while he does not wax very enthusiastic about the yokel idea that you have, he seems to think the Spokane flood may have some relation to the white silts in southern British Columbia. I urged him to write you and ask whether there's any field evidence definitely disproving this connection. In either case, we would both be very much interested in knowing your opinion. I have just been reading Kirk Bryan's article on the Palu soil problem, which apparently does not tell us much more than we knew before. I hope the survey has not begun to publish articles which are mere reviews of the literature. <laughs> With best wishes, sincerely yours, Richard Foster Flint, May of 1927. Dear Dick, after you have read the accompanying abstract and discussion, you will realize that putting my conception over on the USGS is going to keep me busy for another field season. This is after the ambush, right? Five months after the ambush. 
If I were to express all the ideas and interrelationships of ideas that I have in mind, I would spend the rest of the afternoon dictating, and you would never have time to read it all. Suffice it to say that I feel confident that another field season will lay the ghosts of a post-Spokane diastrophism, of sequence instead of contemporaneity in channel use, and of rock basins by any mechanism other than plucking. We shall let the smoke of battle settle during the summer, but get some big ammunition dumps built up for next winter's campaign. Give your student in British Columbia the accompanying duplicate and tell him that white silts are of Wisconsin age, red in other words, and that for this and other adequate reasons, it is impossible to correlate them with the Spokane flood episode. Very truly yours, Harlan Bretz. So Bretz goes off to the summer field season of 1927 with his new crop of UC students, and they double down on all their observations in the Scablands and down the gorge in response to the ambush earlier that year. That December, in Cleveland, Bretz presents orally his new paper on the bars of the Scablands, and at that Cleveland meeting, this is about a year after the ambush meeting, He's got, I got one episode making all these bars, and I like the Spokane flood. You hanging with me? We've gone back a couple steps in the timeline. We're revisiting a few of these themes in the last few shows, but these letters are showing, in addition to the published papers, that the ambush beating did not cause Brett to totally change his work or change his hypothesis of the Spokane Flood. As we saw late last time, and we're seeing again right now, he's doubling down on the Spokane Flood. He says it's even bigger than he thought before, after double-checking all these elevations and uh, deposit dimensions and so on. I'm having a good time. Hope you are too. Summer of 28, now he's in, this is what we did with Sky last time, remember? Talking about all these marginal channels down the Walla Walla area, and the papers exist for that. Okay, record number of emails since the last show. Many, too many to keep track of, I apologize. Folks, fixing up the old photos from that glorious magazine article. I knew you would like that. I knew you would like that magazine. That's why I read the whole frickin' thing to you. And those photos from that magazine article were priceless. And again, I, two dozen different people uh, took their crack at improving the photos. Thank you, everyone, for working with those photos. I'm going to share just a few of them that I got. Uh, first of all, it wasn't Margaret in Spokane. Uh, I, even in the live chat last show, I didn't see it, but Cheryl is the research librarian in Pullman who found this a wonderful magazine, and Cheryl has since, as a reference librarian, found a number of other things for us. So thank you, Sharon. Uh, one of the highlights of all this viewer contribution stuff is this article from September of 1928. And if you didn't see the last show, you don't know what we're talking about, but we read the whole thing with all that glorious detail of Brett's enlarged with their bedrolls out in the courthouse lawn of Ephrata at 4.30 in the morning and so on. That's the article that I read to you. And here are these amazing photographs. This is Armstrong and Brett's in late July of 1928. Hopefully David McWalter, the Dry Falls State Park ranger, is still with us because he's using these materials for his grand 100-year celebration his centennial coming up in July of, 19, of, of 2028, four years from now. So in the last show, I said, can we do something with this pimply stuff here and all these glitches? Like, you know, there must be a way to fix this. But we didn't really have the original. And a bunch of you emailed and said, you don't have a choice. This is what the, the, the actual print material was in the, in the magazine. You're not going to be able to get rid of those, basically. Well, Ken, I'm just selecting as an example, but there were many of you 
Uh, Ken says, look, I, I've got Photoshop. I crop and straighten the photo. I remove the scratches. I dust the stains in, in, in Photoshop. Then I use Topaz Photo AI. I have no idea what I'm talking about, but a bunch of you guys know about this AI stuff. To upscale and perform noise removal. Then I use Palette.fm to colorize. Then I go back to Photoshop to fix any last color issues and replace the sky. Ken says, let's not screw around. I'm going to replace the sky. I'm not just going to clean up your photo. I'm going to replace the sky. Sky? There's the original photo. Let's replace the sky. Oh, I got to go full on that. Ken says, let's replace the sky. Let's put some drama in the sky. <laughs> That's just one example of all these amazing improved images. This is somebody else. Took the pimply stuff. Took the pimply stuff. This is the original. And removed the pimply. And then we have kind of a a nice look there. Someone else removed the pimply, got a little bit more definition on some of these Princeton guys. I can even start to see faces much better than I could before. Again, I, I'm, I'm obsessed now, like, which one is Thomas Large, because I know he was there. Which one is George Beck, the geology teacher from Ellensburg? I think he's one of these older guys. Colorize it. AI did some kind of smoothing or some sort of like almost caricature kind of thing. It's kind of an interesting look. I'm sure you've got favorites. Everybody's got different favorites. I just wanted to share them all. I got a few more of those, by the way. But let's go back. It's been a long time since I've, I've read to you from the old man memories. Do you remember that? Before Christmas, I was doing this almost every show. Brett's in his 90s, uh, typed up a bunch of memories, looking back many, many decades. And I, I've kind of forgotten about it, to be honest with you. Uh, I found those last night, went through it, grabbed a couple from that day in July of 1928 to add even more detail to the magazine. Remember, this is the, this is the opening, the grand opening of Dry Falls State Park, 1928. Bratz is an old guy. One of my field parties during mapping of the scab land, anastomosis, which took several months in the summer, one at a time, coincided with part of an itinerary of a student group led by Professor Richard Field from Princeton University. They were seeing geological highlights of the U.S. by way of a specially equipped Pullman car switched from one railroad to another to fit their itinerary. The Spokane Chamber of Commerce, that's Armstrong, had been informed of their coming and had provided automobiles to take both the Princeton and Chicago groups for a day on the Columbia Plateau and some of its more spectacular units. That's what we were covering last week, our last time with the magazine article. Field and I distributed the boys so that each car had occupants from both schools. Oh, that's cool. I didn't read that till right now, carefully. So each car had one Chicago kid and one Princeton kid. That's kind of a nice mixer. My impression of the Princeton boys was that the Pullman trip, lasting most of the summer, was highly valued by parents as a safe way of getting rid of their kids during a summer vacation of their own. He's a snarky son of a bitch, Bretts. It was a hot day, especially for our examination of Grand Coulee, and one Princeton boy asked in exasperation why they... Oh, I'm gonna, i got to get rid of this. Hang on. Hang on, Patrick. One Princeton boy asked in exasperation why they call this a coulee. And one of my students reported on the note-taking of the Princetonian in his car. Twice he got out his notebook, once to write the word basalt and once to write coolie. 
And it was also reported to me that a Princeton student complained to one of my boys that your professor tells us nothing. He just asks questions. <laughs> Brett's more pimply stuff. Brett's clean it up. Brett's clean it up. AI, baby. Clean it up. Clean it up with that kind of futuristic art deco kind of look. I kind of like it. Thank you to all. Back to the letters. You know what I'm doing now. I'm trying to keep, keep track of time, but we're switching who's writing to whom. Now it's back to Brett's and Flint. April of 1929. Dear Dick, thanks very much for the separate of your excellent article on glacial stagnation. I think you are wholly right, and I surely enjoyed seeing you take the old fogies to task. I also, I think also that the suggestions from Aaron Waters regarding the origin of terrace deposits in Okanagan Valley are correct, though at the time I thought of them as more like outwash aprons in front of a retreating ice tongue. I hope that somebody will able, be able to get into that Okanagan Valley and study them in detail. They are very well expressed and almost entirely lacking in any covering of vegetation. Well, even today, it feels like the Okanagan Valley and all those terraces and deposits are not studied as carefully as they could be. Flint did a bunch with it. Aaron Waters did some with it. Uh, Sky Cooley, Jerome Lessman have been up there doing some stuff with them. The Okanagan still feels, I think even Sky said it in the last show, it still feels like it's a pr frontier. Then of the last field season, and I mean it, the last field season of Brett's, except for one field season in 1952, this is it. This is his last time in the 20s for sure. And he's over in the Missoula area. Why? And he's in the Spokane area. Why? And he's over in the Wenatchee area. And a little bit down here up uh, Whitebird and uh, that sort of thing. Grangeville. Jerome Lessman grabbed these, this portion of the summer field notes of, of 1929. This is Brett's in his field notes. The hypothesis above suggested that these broad undulating ridges of gravel are Spokane in age is going to require much less in the way of Wisconsin water. It is also going to require an ice-free Spokane Valley for a very great Spokane glacial river. If bursting of the dam of Glacial Lake Missoula, our topic at today's show, everybody, caused the Scabland flood, the ice margin must have retreated from Spokane Valley from the Spangle Lobe, and probably from much of the lower Spokane Valley, below the city, and from the Columbia Valley along the north side of the Scablands as far as west of the Grand Coulee. Okay, it sounded like he's getting off the Spokane flood there, doesn't it? In his last field season, 1929, is Brett starting to get off the Spokane flood and the Spokane ice? Is he the guy that started erasing it from the maps? Let's continue. This seems a feasible way to get water from Lake Missoula to enter all ha channel heads as far west as Grand Coulee. There is no field evidence against it. Indeed, there is a lack of field evidence for the view that the ice was at its southern limit when the flood occurred. If the ice at Spokane had stood at its furthest extent at that time, one, Lake Coeur d'Alene should have then overflowed to the southwest. Two, stream notches should have been cut along the south slope of the Spokane Valley if the ice was then against the base of the slope. And three, mica channel should have been the dominant channel, if not the only channel, for Scabland water. So then you're like, okay, maybe he is. 1929. When he types up his paper, maybe he'll talk about that. He never does. He never does talk about Glacial Lake Missoula in the 1920s. Why? He spent a bunch of days in Glacial Lake Missoula. Maybe the letters can help us hear what he's thinking. Brett's to large.
How are we doing? This is one of the most amazing letters in the collection from the Eugene team, Jody and the Eugene team. And as soon as I got this one, October of 1929, written from Brett's to Large, I sent it immediately to Jerome and Sky and Joel. And Jerome in particular was in seventh heaven because Jerome's been thinking about along these lines and to see Brett's write it in a letter, not in a paper, but in a letter after his last field season out here in the 20s. He goes on. This is a long letter. It's the last major letter we're going to look at. Once we get through this major letter, I'm just going to read it. I'm not going to comment, I don't think, a whole lot because there's some of it I still don't think I even understand or follow. But after we get through this monster letter, then there's hardly anything left. We're almost done. Are you ready for this letter? It's a beauty. And I think it's going to bring up specifics that we haven't had before in what Brett's is thinking at the tail end of the 1920s. Dear Large, your letter mailed on the 3rd did not reach me until the 7th. And for 24 hours, it was impossible for me to get around to answer it. I hope this reaches you in time. This is October 8th of 1929. By the way, when, when's the stock... I said I wasn't going to add commentary. I can't help it. Somebody in the live chat in the last show talked about the stock market crash. I never even thought about that. Is that October 1929? Is one of the reasons that Brett doesn't come out here in 30 and 31 and 32 because of the Depression? It never even occurred to me. I think it's October 29, isn't it? When all those guys in New York are jumping out the window and everything? The stock market, stock market crash? I should know that. I don't. Brett's to large. We spent about three weeks studying the records of Lake Missoula in the endeavor to learn its connection with the scab land of the plateau. No direct evidence of a cataclysmic burst of the lake was found. The lake, record, the lake records are curiously involved and seem to indicate the probability of several lake stages. The shorelines of Glacial Lake Missoula are all faint from bottom to top, and the silt deposits of the valley floors lie in definite flats. The lower, gentler slopes of the mountain walls below the steeper slopes which carry the shorelines having no silt deposits on them. We were talking about this with Larry today. I am at a loss, Bretz, Bretz is at a loss to account for these absence of silt mantle on these gentler slopes between the steep mountain walls and the valley flats. We found this relationship to be true in every major valley occupied by Lake Missoula. I tried to develop an explanation of the silt flats in terms of different smaller and later lakes than the one which left the high faint shorelines but there were difficulties in working out a complete sequence. Last summer, 1928, Alden told me that he thought William Morris Davis wrong in introducing glacial ice in Clark Fork Valley near Thompson Falls, that what Davis had taken for moraine was simply sand dune topography on a surface of some nondescript or unrecognizable valley fill. As a result of our work this summer, I shall take sharp issue with Alden on this and shall support Davis with enthusiasm, for William Morris Davis is right. You will remember that Pardee described some high-level deltas in Lake Missoula and that Campbell, back in 1915, followed him in this interpretation. Davis says that these are probably high-lying fragments of lateral moraine. Pardee did not climb to any of these. Campbell certainly did not, for his figures are, of altitudes are wrong. And Davis did not, as he says in his paper. We did. And these so-called deltas are quite surely, as Davis says they are, fragments of lateral moraine, recording an ice tongue in Clark Fork Valley near Thompson Falls at least 180 feet thick. There's much more to this letter, but this is a theme that continues in the letters, you know, emails. It's almost like 
the geologists today, in response to these episodes, we should be writing to each other with typewriters. We should have a record of these conversations, not to be self-important, but we're doing the same back and forth that these guys are doing, but I don't think there's going to be any records of these emails going back and forth, but we're writing letters back and forth, basically. This is still a problem with the letters this winter, letters this winter between us. What's going on on the sides of the Rathstrom Prairie? Are those gulch fills? Are those flood deposits? Are those lateral moraines made out of till? How much is fashion of the day and how much is, can we just get somebody who knows what these deposits are for real and make a call on some of these things? It's 100 years later and we're still having basically the same conversations is what I'm trying to say. I was going to do it. I guess I might as well. This is a beautiful poster by uh, Dean Garwood, 2019, Shadow Relief Map of Northern Idaho and Parts of Southwestern Montana. And there's a bunch here, but here's Glace, uh, Lake Pend Oreille where the ice dam was, and I want you really to notice this thing here. This is just an incredible, I'm looking at it backwards, an incredible plane called the Rathdrum Prairie, right here. And Spokane, Washington is down here. So the ice dam is where the lake is sitting. There's no gravels in the bottom of that, apparently. And then there's like a thousand feet of gravels sitting in this Rathdrum Prairie. And this kind of story about what do these gravels represent, look at what it looks like on a geologic map. This pale yellow is the Rathdrum Prairie. Mora says this, I say that, Alden says he's wrong. It's the same discussions. It's exciting we're still having the same discussions. It also feels like, my God, can, can anybody figure this stuff out? Indeed, we found more than Davis saw in the way of evidence for ice in this great trough. We found that a lobe had come southward from the Little Bitterroot across Camas Prairie, clearly into the Flathead Valley at Perma. We found also that although Ice Tongue had pushed down across Lynch Creek to Plains and actually entered the Clark Fork Valley at this place, I'm going to continue even though I have no idea where I am at the moment. This, coupled with what Davis found in Flathead Valley, is the way of older, more extended moraine. Seems to show that the great trough of the Flathead Clark Fork from Dixon down to Thompson Falls has had ice in several places, if not throughout its range. This, of course, was not the Wisconsin ice. So he's talking about Spokane ice over in Montana. And I'm continuing to read this letter even though I don't know the geography over there. Most of us in the live chat don't know the geography over there, but this is almost like just for the sake of the record. And by the way, I'm still not sure how I'm going to like, am I going to post all these letters? I haven't yet. Have you noticed? I've just been reading these letters to you. Should I make a huge PDF of all these letters? I don't know. I guess I should. I have permission to. Keep it going, boy. There's a bunch more to this letter. This is Remember, this is Brett's talking to Large in the fall of 1929. I therefore suspect that the different silt-depositing lakes, if there were different ones, were controlled by ice in different places and therefore at different levels. I would follow that they were therefore were not dammed by the Pandere ice at the extreme lower end of the valley. The higher upper shorelines apparently can be attributed to a damming at Lake Pandere. But the outlet of this high-level lake, which probably was not the silt-depositing lake, was certainly not at the place indicated by Parti, Campbell, and Davis. We traversed the entire mountain crest between Granite Creek and Johnson Creek here and found that the map is wrong and that no notch as low as 
4200 exists. He's busting his ass with his students to find all these new discoveries. Why isn't he publishing on them? Isn't that weird? Also, that there's absolutely no channel way of any sort across any of the sags or saddles in this mountain range. If Lake Missoula at its maximum stage had an outlet, it was elsewhere. The only good evidence that I found between Lake Ponderé and Spokane for escaping glacial water of the cataclysmic burst necessary to make the scab land, you also saw. It seems possible that such bench scab land on basalt and on granite might be attributed to fairly normal marginal drainage if an ice tongue occupied the Spokane Valley at that time. I do not consider that the existence of these notches and gashes establishes the occurrence of a catastrophic burst of Lake Missoula. Now, he's, now he doesn't see a catastrophic burst? Are we into the Missoula floods or not, Harley? Do you like Glacial Lake Missoula as the source of the water? Doesn't seem like you're sure. After three weeks of being in the field in Montana, uh, understandable. The floor of the valley at Rathdrum Prairie apparently must be considered a subdued ground moraine composed of an extremely gravelly till. Well, we're looking for till all over the Spokane area, and according to Brett's, the entire Rathdrum Prairie is till. That's new. I don't think anybody's saying that today. I saw almost equally gravelly till at Polson, Sky Cooley country, at the south end of Flathead Lake, and in some moraine deposits in the Columbia Valley, a few miles below Wenatchee, that's Malaga, Sharon. The composition, therefore, of this material does not worry me greatly, but it is obvious that no such moraine topography could have been traversed by the waters from a bursting Lake Missoula without being destroyed. Coupled with this moraine on the floor of Spokane Valley in Rathdrum Prairie is the moraine on Sunset Prairie and Indian Prairie, west of Spokane. It clearly overlies Scabland Basalt and clearly in the Willow Lake and Granite Lake Channel blocks the head of the channel. I have therefore concluded that the Spokane glaciation named by the till sheet on Sunset Indian Paradise and other prairies is later than the Spokane flood recorded by the Scabland channels. I have reached essentially the same conclusion from the studies at the mouth of Moses Cooley and Wenatchee River. This sounds important. I don't think I totally understand it yet. And it's a little fuzzy, but that's okay. Grateful for the opportunity to read this letter. The great erosion of Moses Cooley occurred before the invasion of Columbia Valley, at least as far down as Rock Island Rapids, by a tongue of ice. Very good moranic topography extends from Wenatchee down to the rapids, and there apparently crowds over onto the basalt gravel that came down Moses Cooley. Whether this ice tongue came down Wenatchee Valley or Columbia Valley to Rock Island Rapids, I am not yet certain. But it is a case of a glacier later than the Scabland flood. Look, this guy's never coming back. This guy talks like he's going to see it next summer. He never comes back. Is that because of the stock market crash? Nobody's talking about ice over Wenatchee or south of Wenatchee. Why is that narrative gone? It's the same thing with Brett's. Every time you're like, well, go ahead to the 1950s where he backtracks off everything. He never does. I find it fascinating so many angles involving field sites that we all care deeply about as geology people in Washington. It's clear this guy's talented. It's clear this guy has all this experience. It's clear that this guy can see things in a day that takes most people a whole field season. So I'm not willing to just read these letters and go, okay, well, this guy obviously is out of it. I'm willing to listen to this guy because you've seen that theme throughout the entire series, haven't we? What did Sky say? If you're confused in an area and you're confused what's going on, go back and read Brent's. He's usually right. 
Well, these are seem like pretty radical statements to make. Again, half of them I don't even totally understand yet. I'm just going to keep rereading these letters. But it's exciting. Unpublished stuff that's maybe unpublished because he never did fully believe it. But maybe it's not published because of some other reason. And he did believe it. You still with me? We still got to go. We still got more than 800. Let's finish this out. Thank you for your patience. I'm having a ball. Finally, it's it's quiet in the hallway after 45 minutes of... Yeah. I have revised my interpretation of Lidgerwood Terrace. No idea where that is. Also, it fits in perfectly with the ascending profile of gra gravel terraces as far as Rathdom. And I have concluded that Spokane Valley from Rathdrum down was completely filled to the level of these terraces along the north side with the valley train, which is now largely eroded away. The water which made this valley train crossed at Legendum Terrace to the Little Spokane and also went around to the south and west sides of Five Mile Prairie in the Spokane area and thence on down toward the Columbia. This water certainly did not escape by way of Cheney Palouse Gablin. Spelling for the terraces are about 200 feet too low. That these terraces belong to the Rathdrum Prairie ground moraine, I am not yet sure. I am inclined to think they are older. The gravel, sand and silt of Lataw Creek in the Spokane area, seem to be backwash filling in the blocked tributary at the time that this Lidgerwood Valley train was built. There is a great, this is great teaching, by the way. This is great teaching. I'm wearing a red shirt. I'm totally lost. I have no idea what this guy is saying, and I keep reading the letter. You know why? It feels important to me. It's never been seen. There's a few people watching this program who know what's going on here, and they go, oh, my God, I had no idea. So we're pleasing three people right now. Join me. This material was deposited by southward moving water, and this gradation indicates the degrees in velocity southward. It apparently is not a deposit of water coming on past Spangle down to North Pine Channel and the Cheney Palouse routes to the Snake. Thus, the record of Scabland Channel making seems to be older than any moraine or gravel deposits in Leitar or Spokane Valleys thus far studied. There is the one exception, however, of the high-level, drifted erratics along the margins of the Spokane Valley and up the slopes of Coeur d'Alene Valley. These have the right altitude to belong to the Scabland spillways and are far too high to be related to the terrace making. Furthermore, they are berg carried clearly and are not glacially transported to their resting places. We found considerably more evidence in the valleys east of the Channel Scabland of the enormous backwash which is subject of my latest paper. Some of this was up the Clearwater, 25 miles beyond Lewiston. Some was at the near Spokane at Mount Hope. I have found it consistently true that every valley I entered in this part of the Palouse country has the same extraordinary records of backwash up to the upper limit of the Scabland flood. He's, he's on a roll. What's Thomas Large thinking when he's reading this thing? This thing's a, a book. Is Thomas Large following all this? Have they been talking this much about it? Or is Brett just basically typing this stuff out and thinking as he goes? Some of us write like that. You just start writing. You can't stop. It just helps to get it out. You just happen to lick the stamp and send it to Spokane, to Thomas. This guy's not even winding down. And we're on page 7. The Scabland flood immediately to the west. We have had simply no failure yet in applying this criterion. The material never is higher and invariably is present within the proper limits. I consider this to be of extreme significance. Okay, I don't have to guess anymore that's important. He's telling Thomas Large, extreme significance. This doesn't sound like a guy who's ready to never come out here again, does it? To me, this is a guy who's just getting started. And yet he's not. He's never coming back until 1952 as a 70-year-old. The plateau at the head of Moses Cooley turns out to be considerably lower than I had previously thought. 
low enough to allow a discharge across from the Columbia at the time the Grand Coulee was initiated. There seems almost no possibility of making Moses Cooley and Grand Cooley sequential. If water went across the divide over one, it surely would go over the other. More data collected in Moses Cooley and in Grand Cooley covering the great stream bars, all data harmonizing perfectly with my interpretation and the accumulated evidence making the conclusion simply irresistible. There is no other way to explain the great hills of gravel in these Scabland canyons. The mouth of Moses Cooley, or rather, the portion of the Columbia Valley at the mouth of Moses Cooley, bears very striking evidence of an enormous mass of 99% basalt, gravel, built into it from the east and reaching completely across to the west side, thus actually blocking the Columbia Valley itself. I was amazed to find this situation for I had not imagined it possible. But it is there, and there are several lines of very convincing evidence that this immense deposit of gravel, of which I am writing, came down from Moses Cooley and did not come down the Columbia. There is also evidence that it was actually built up from the Columbia somewhat. These are difficult things for the conventionally-minded student to accept, but they are facts. I wish I could go into more detail regarding this. New paragraph. Perhaps the most spectacular situation we encountered this summer were in the Yakima Valley between Benton City and Prosser. Yeah, he loved that Chandler Narrows. My God. The north wall of the Yakima Valley is diversified with some of the best developed Scabland topography on the plateau. Everything which characterizes Scabland is there and on a large-scale development. I do not need to list all the features, Thomas. The upper limit is also there, the same upper limit that I found in the Walla Walla Valley, almost directly east, and the same characteristic pebbly silts which scratched boulders and pebbles scattered sporadically through. They ended up, they extend up the Yakima Valley as far as Union Gap, with an upper limit of the bird drifted material of 1100. Again, the same figure that I found in the Walla Walla Valley. The significance of this Yakima Valley scabland is that there was an enormous rush of water back up a valley, the Yakima Valley, through a narrows or constricted place into a broadened place. There is no possibility that any of this water could have gone on through. The Great Bar deposits, with their four set beds dipping up the Yakima at Benton and at Prosser, could have been made in no other conceivable way than by an enormous flood coming down across the plateau and the total quantity of water necessary to do this work be rather closely approximated. For the whole of the Yakima Valley within the significant area is mapped by contours. I have not yet computed this, but when it, it is done, the volume will turn out to be very small indeed compared to the work done, and the need for enormous velocity will become more obvious than ever before. This, of course, leads us directly back to the Spokane flood hypothesis, Thomas. Good Lord, man, it's almost 1930, and I'm still talking about the Spokane frickin' flood. I'm screaming in my office right now. People are concerned about me in the hallway. Even though some may want the repeat the performance several times to get a larger volume, draining the valley in the interims, yet the quantity multiplied by 10 will prove to be very small indeed. We just found outside the mouth of the Yakima Valley on the east slope of Rattlesnake Mountain some very surprising berg deposits. They constitute mounds 100 feet or more in diameter and 200, even 300 feet high, mounds that are composed of glacial drift lying on the ringgold surface at their place. They are separate mounds, spaced rather wildly, but a, do a dozen or 20 being visible from almost any viewpoint. The material in these mounds was largely of granite, but second in importance certainly was the belt metamorphic material of northern Idaho and northern Montana. There are also a good sc a scattering of granodiorite porphyry, which I have been finding all over the area affected by the Spokane flood. I'm getting lightheaded. Furthermore, there was, oh my God, thankfully we're to a very truly yours. Thankfully, there's almost no nice, though if icebergs which brought this debris to this place had come from breaking up of the Okanagan lobe, the Shushwap nice 
would have been very prominent indeed, since the home of the Grand Ole Diorite apparently is on the east side of the Lake Ponderé, according to Anderson at any rate. It and the belt metamorphics indicate the great mass of berg ice were carried from areas east of the state of Washington across to strand on the west side of the Columbia, north of the mouth of the Yakima. I hope that this brief and rather unorganized... Brief? Are you fucking kidding me? Sorry, Patrick. I hope that this brief and rather unorganized statement will serve your purpose. It is all that I can get ready for you within the time limit. I hope that Alden will not be at the meeting, for I would like to spring some of this on him without warning. Will you let me know after your meetings if he was present or is likely to have gotten wind of these announcements? Your letter contains the information for which I wrote the other day relative to the amount of money you sent me. Thank you very much. Very truly yours, Harlan Bretz. I forgot it was that long. Sorry. I think I need a shower at this point. I know we're pushing three hours and we're basically done. That was way longer than I thought it was. Obviously, Large needed something from him before some meeting. I need to figure out what meeting Large was about to hold in November or December of 1929. Maybe somebody can figure it out. Was it the Northwest Scientific Association? Maybe it was. But to have that debrief And so much detail in a letter. Like, we're not just asking about how the kids are. I mean, this is like major. We're going to finish with this. I have permission to share this. That was an old letter from almost 100 years ago. This is a letter from three hours ago from Vic Baker, who is essentially a direct descendant of Brett's. He didn't study under Brett's, but you remember Vic Baker from a week ago. He's, I guess, in his 70s now, maybe early 80s, I'm not sure. And Brett's is a lifelong devotee of Brett's. Did I say Baker is a lifelong devotee of Brett's. Richard Waite, who is from the Richard Foster Flint, Stephen Porter, Richard Waite lineage, will be our guest in session Y. So in this series, we have the two direct descendants of Brett's and Flint, essentially. And I shared that letter and some others with Vic. And here's Vic's response. I promise we will quit with this. And again, I got I double-checked with Vic if it's okay if I read his email to you. And that's how we will finish. Nick, I finally got time to look carefully at the 1925 Brett's to Large letters that you sent. They are indeed highly interesting. I knew of Brett's understanding that Davis was supportive of his outrageous hypothesis. We haven't gotten to that, but we'll do that next time. I will have to dig through my ancient and chaotic files to see how I came to this impression, but my recollection is that it was via Brett's personal reminiscence. What is most interesting to me is the three weeks spent by Brett's in checking out Glacial Lake Missoula and not recognizing the evidence for its early phase of massive outflow that was so ably described by Pardee 10 years later. This is consistent with Bretz's probably reluctant tentative acceptance in 1927 of Pardee's suggestion of Glacial Lake Missoula as the Spokane flood source. 
Brett's clearly adopted Glacial Lake Missoula as a likely means of solving, at least in the mind of his critics, the source problem for the massive flooding. It is interesting, Brett's never published his Montana observations. Like T.C. Chamberlain, William Morris Davis, and Maurice Campbell, J. Harlan Bretz interpreted Glacial Lake Missoula evidence of immense, basalt, uh, fl immense flood bars, scour of valley sides, and high eddy deposits, or eddy bars, as lateral moraine material. With so much glacial ice in western Montana, there was no Glacial Lake Missoula pathway to take the water to the channeled scablin. Brett's also remarks on the pathway from Lake Ponderé through the Rathdrum Prairie to Spokane. My early connection in the late 1960s with Paul Weiss of the USGS showed how that kind of interpretation persisted. But this is yet another item for an extended discussion. There is much more to be said about these letters, the relation of Davis to Brett's, etc., all of this is nicely il illustrative of how a scientific investigation actually works, as opposed to how it gets communicated through the scientific papers that eventually get published. Cheers. Vic Baker. And the story continues. And the series continues. A toast to you. Here's to you, the 786 live viewers who are still with us. Congratulations to you for your persistence. Whether you're baking bread or doing macrame or changing the baby's diaper or whatever you're doing, you're with us and I appreciate you. Warning, the stream's current bit rate is lower than recommended. Okay, well, maybe you're having trouble with the broadcast, but I need to finish it out. Here's to Larry Smith, our guest today. Seems like three days ago that we had Larry on. Larry, thank you for your time and your interest in being part of this series. Appreciate it. Here's to all the community viewers the community viewers, the collection of viewers who are contributing to this community. All of your efforts, whether it's in this forum, being in the live chat and contributing your thoughts, positive or negative, doesn't matter. Of course, all the emails. Here's to you. Here's to your health the health of your community, the health of your family and friends, your physical and your mental health. A quick look at the schedule before we sign off. Of course, I want to go over three hours now, have I? I'm sure I have. This coming Sunday is February 4th. At 9 o'clock in the morning Pacific time, we will have Sean Wilsey from the College of Southern Idaho helping us understand the Bonneville flood. It will be another red shirt show. A week from today, John Schellenberger of the Yakima Nation will have a very special visit with us sharing some of his oral traditions of the Ice Age floods from a Native American eyewitness experience. Don't miss that one. That will be a very unique show. John's a wonderful guy. Scott Burns, Portland State University, will be here going back to the Columbia River Gorge and going back to old times, so I will not be wearing a red shirt for that show. And breaking news, Richard Waite will be our guest talking about whatever Richard Waite wants to talk about on Thursday, February 15th. And our final show of the series, Sunday, February 18th at 9 a.m. Still not sure, but 
almost sure that it will be four heads on screen for session Z. Head number one, Jerome, Sky Cooley, Joel Gombiner. Talking about Moses Cooley, Grand Cooley, Okanagan, and the Inqua Conference in the 1960s. Thanks, everybody. I love you. Thank you so much for watching this series and for watching this episode on Glacial Lake Missoula in western Montana. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Wow, the finale is going to be lit. It's going to be lit. I. Right. It's going to be lit. <laughs>